The 80-20th's principle, the secret of achieving more with less. Richard Cook, Part 1, Overture. 1. Welcome to the 80-20th's principle. For a very long time, the Pareto law the 80-20th's principle has lumbered the economic scene like an erratic block on the landscape, an empirical law which nobody can explain. Joseph Steindl. The 80-20th's principle can and should be used by every intelligent person in their daily life by every organization, and by every social grouping and form of society. It can help individuals and groups achieve much more, with much less effort. The 80-20th's principle can raise personal effectiveness and happiness. It can multiply the profitability of corporations and the effectiveness of any organization. It even holds the key to raising the quality and quantity of public services while cutting their cost. This book, the first ever on the 80-20th's principle, is written from a burning conviction, validated in personal and business experience, that this principle is one of the best ways of dealing with and transcending the pressures of modern life. What is the 80-20th's principle? The 80-20th's principle asserts that a minority of causes, inputs, or effort usually lead to a majority of the results, outputs or rewards. Taken literally, this means that, for example, 80% of what you achieve Indiana your job comes from 20% of the time spent. Thus for all practical purposes, four-fifths of the effort a dominant part of it is largely irrelevant. This is contrary to what people normally expect. So the 80-20th's principle states that there is an inbuilt imbalance between causes and results, inputs and outputs, and effort and reward. A good benchmark for this imbalance is provided by the 80-20th's relationship. A typical pattern will show that 80% of outputs and result from 20% of inputs, that 80% of consequences flow from 20% of causes, or that 80% of results come from 20% of effort. Figure 1 shows these typical patterns. In business, many examples of the 80-20th's principle have been validated. 20% of products usually account for about 80% of dollar sales value, so do 20% of customers. 20% of products Oregon customers usually also account for about 80% of an organization's profits. In society, 20% of criminals account for 80% of the value of all crime. 20% of motorists cause 80% of accidents. 20% of those who marry comprise 80% of the divorce statistics, those who consistently remarry and re-divorce distort the statistics and give a lopsidedly pessimistic impression of the extent of marital fidelity. 20% of children attain 80% of educational qualifications available. In the home, 20% of your carpets are likely to get 80% of the wear. 20% of your clothes will be worn 80% of the time. And if you have an intruder alarm, 80% of the false alarms will be set off by 20% of the possible causes. The internal combustion engine is a great tribute to the 80-20th's principle. 80% of the energy is wasted in combustion and only 20% gets to the wheels, this 20% of the input generates 100% of the output. Pareto's discovery, systematic and predictable lack of balance. The pattern underlying the 80-20th's principle was discovered in 1897, exactly 100 years ago, by Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto, 1848-1923. His discovery has since been called many names, including the Pareto Principle, the Pareto Law, the 80-20th's Rule, the Principle of Least Effort and the Principle of Imbalance, throughout this book we will call it the 80-20th's Principle. By a subterranean process of influence on many important achievers, especially business people, computer enthusiasts, and quality engineers, the 80-20th's principle has helped to shape the modern world. Yet it has remained one of the great secrets of our time and even the select band of conoscenti who know and use the 80-20th's principle only exploit a tiny proportion of its power. So what did Vilfried de Pareto discover? He happened to be looking at patterns of wealth and income in 19th century England. He found that most income and wealth went to a minority of the people in his samples. Perhaps there was nothing very surprising in this. 
but he also discovered two other facts that he thought highly significant. One was that there was a consistent mathematical relationship between the proportion of people, as a percentage of the total relevant population, and the amount of income or wealth that this group enjoyed. Point four to simplify, if 20% of the population enjoyed 80% of the wealth 5 then you could reliably predict that 10% would have, say, 65% of the wealth, and 5% would have 50%. The key point is not the percentages, but the fact that the distribution of wealth across the population was predictably unbalanced. Pareto's other finding, one that really excited him, was that this pattern of imbalance was repeated consistently whenever he looked at data referring to different time periods or different countries. Whether he looked at England in earlier times, or whatever data were available from other countries in his own time or earlier, he found the same pattern repeating itself, over and over again, with mathematical precision. Was this a freak coincidence, or something that had great importance for economics and society? Would it work if applied to sets of data relating to things other than wealth or income? Pareto was a terrific innovator. Because before him no one had looked at two related sets of data in this case, the distribution of incomes or wealth, compared to the number of income earners or property owners and compared percentages between the two sets of data. Nowadays this method is commonplace, and has led to major breakthroughs in business and economics. Sadly, although Pareto realized the importance and wide range of his discovery, he was very bad at explaining it. He moved on to a series of fascinating but rambling sociological theories, centering on the role of elites, which were hijacked at the end of his life by Mussolini's fascists. The significance of the 80-20ths principle lay dormant for a generation. While a few economists, especially in the US 6 realized its importance, it was not until after the Second World War that two parallel yet completely different pioneers began to make waves with the 80-20ths principle. 1949, Zipf's principle of least effort. One of these pioneers was the Harvard professor of philology, George K. Zipf. In 1949 Zipf discovered the principle of least effort, which was actually a rediscovery and elaboration of Pareto's principle. Zipf's principle said that resources, people, goods, time, skills, or anything else that is productive, tended to arrange themselves so as to minimize work, so that approximately 20-30% of any resource accounted for 70-80% of the activity related to that resource. Professor Zipf used population statistics, books, philology, and industrial behavior to show the consistent recurrence of this unbalanced pattern. For example, he analyzed all the Philadelphia marriage licenses granted in 1931 in a 20-block area, demonstrating that 70% of the marriages occurred between people who lived within 30% of the distance. Incidentally, Zipf also provided a scientific justification for the messy desk for justifying clutter with another law, frequency of use draws near to us things that are frequently used. Intelligent secretaries have long known that files in frequent use should not be filed. 1951, Euron's rule of the vital few and the rise of Japan. The other pioneer of the 80-20ths principle was the great quality guru, Romanian-born US engineer Joseph Moses Euron born 1904, the man behind the quality revolution of 1950 -90. He made what he alternately called the Pareto Principle and the rule of the vital few virtually synonymous with the search for high product quality. In 1924, Euron joined Western Electric, the manufacturing division of Bell Telephone System, starting as a corporate industrial engineer and later setting up as one of the world's first quality consultants. His great idea was to use the 80-20ths principle, together with other statistical methods, to root out quality faults and improve the reliability and value of industrial and consumer goods. Euron's path-breaking quality control handbook was first published in 1951 and extolled the 80-20ths principle in very broad terms. The economist Pareto found that wealth was non-uniformly distributed in the same way as Euron's observations about quality losses. Many other instances can be found the distribution of crime amongst criminals, the distribution of accidents among hazardous processes, etc. 
Pareto's principle of unequal distribution applied to distribution of wealth and to distribution of quality losses. No major U.S. industrialist was interested in Euron's theories. In 1953 he was invited to Japan to lecture, and met a receptive audience. He stayed on to work with several Japanese corporations, transforming the value and quality of their consumer goods. It was only once the Japanese threat to U.S. industry had become apparent, after 1970, that Euron was taken seriously in the West. He moved back to do for U.S. industry what he had done for the Japanese. The 80-20th principle was at the heart of this global quality revolution. From the 1960s to the 1990s, progress from using the 80-20th principle. IBM was one of the earliest and most successful corporations to spot and use the 80-20th principle, which helps to explain why most computer systems specialists trained in the 1960s and 1970s are familiar with the idea. In 1963, IBM discovered that about 80% of a computer's time is spent executing about 20% of the operating code. The company immediately rewrote its operating software to make the most used 20% very accessible and user-friendly, thus making IBM computers more efficient and faster than competitors' machines for the majority of applications. Those who developed the personal computer and its software in the next generation, such as Apple, Lotus, and Microsoft, applied the 80-20th's principle with even more gusto to make their machines cheaper and easier to use for a new tranche of customers, including the now celebrated dummies who would previously have given computers a very wide berth. Winner take all. A century after Pareto, the implications of the 80-20th's principle have surfaced in a recent controversy over the astronomic and ever-rising incomes going to superstars and those very few people at the top of a growing number of professions. Film director Steven Spielberg earned $165 million in 1994. Joseph Jamiel, the most highly paid trial lawyer, was paid $90 million. Merely competent film directors or lawyers, of course, earn a tiny fraction of these sums. The 20th century has seen massive efforts to level incomes, but inequality, removed in one sphere, keeps popping up in another. In the USA from 1973 to 1995, average real incomes rose by 36 percent or yet the comparable figure for non-supervisory workers fell by 14 percent or. During the 1980s, all of the gains went to the top 20 percent or of earners, and a mind-boggling 64 percent or of the total increase went to the top 1 percent or. The ownership of shares in the US is also heavily concentrated within a small minority of households, 5% of U.S. households own about 75% of the household sector's equity. A similar effect may be seen in the role of the dollar, almost 50% of world trade is invoiced in dollars, far above America's 13% share of world exports. And, while the dollar's share of foreign exchange reserves is 64%, the ratio of American GDP to global output is just over 20%. The 80-20th's principle will always reassert itself, unless conscious, consistent and massive efforts are made and sustained to overcome it. Why the 80-20th's principle is so important? The reason that the 80-20th's principle is so valuable is that it is counterintuitive. We tend to expect that all causes will have roughly the same significance. That all customers are equally valuable. That every bit of business, every product, and every dollar of sales revenue is as good as another. That all employees in a particular category have roughly equivalent value. That each day or week or year we spend has the same significance. That all our friends have roughly equal value to us. That all inquiries or phone calls should be treated in the same way. That one university is as good as another. That all problems have a large number of causes so that it is not worth isolating a few key causes. That all opportunities are of roughly equal value, so that we treat them all equally. We tend to assume that 50% of causes Oregon inputs will account for 50% of results Oregon outputs. There seems to be a natural, almost democratic, expectation that causes and results are generally equally balanced. And, of course, sometimes they are. 
But this 50-50 fallacy is one of the most inaccurate and harmful, as well as the most deeply rooted, of our mental maps. The 80-20ths principle asserts that when two sets of data, relating to causes and results, can be examined and analyzed, the most likely result is that there will be a pattern of imbalance. The imbalance may be 65-35ths, 70-30ths, 75-25ths, 80-20ths, 95-fifths, or 99.9-0.1, or any set of numbers in between. However, the two numbers in the comparison don't have to add up to 100, see page 23. The 80-20ths principle also asserts that when we know the true relationship, we are likely to be surprised at how unbalanced it is. Whatever the actual level of imbalance, it is likely to exceed our prior estimate. Executives may suspect that some customers and some products are more profitable than others, but when the extent of the difference is proved, they are likely to be surprised and sometimes dumbfounded. Teachers may know that the majority of their disciplinary troubles or most truancy arises from a minority of pupils, but if records are analyzed the extent of the imbalance will probably be larger than expected. We may feel that some of our time is more valuable than the rest, but if we measure inputs and outputs the disparity can still stun us. Why should you care about the 80-20ths principle? Whether you realize it or not, the principle applies to your life, to your social world and to the place where you work. Understanding the 80-20ths principle gives you great insight into what is really happening in the world around you. The overriding message of this book is that our daily lives can be greatly improved by using the 80-20ths principle. Each individual can be more effective and happier. Each profit-seeking corporation can become very much more profitable. Each non-profit organization can also deliver much more useful outputs. Every government can ensure that its citizens benefit much more from its existence. For everyone and every institution, it is possible to obtain much more that is of value, and avoid what has negative value, with much less input of effort, expense, or investment. At the heart of this progress is a process of substitution. Resources that have weak effects in any particular use are not used, or are used sparingly. Resources that have powerful effects are used as much as possible. Every resource is ideally used where it has the greatest value. Wherever possible, weak resources are developed so that they can mimic the behavior of the stronger resources. Business and markets have used this process, to great effect, for hundreds of years. The French economist J.B. Say coined the word around 1800, saying that the entrepreneur shifts economic resources out of an area of lower productivity into an area of higher productivity and yield. But one fascinating implication of the 80-20ths principle is how far businesses and markets still are from producing optimal solutions. For example, the 80-20ths principle asserts that 20 percenter of products Oregon customers or employees are really responsible for about 80 percenter of profits. If this is true and detailed investigations usually confirm that some such very unbalanced pattern exists the state of affairs implied is very far from being efficient or optimal. The implication is that 80 percenter of products Oregon customers or employees are only contributing 20 percenter of profits. That there is great waste. That the most powerful resources of the company are being held back by a majority of much less effective resources. That profits could be multiplied if more of the best sort of products could be sold, employees hired, or customers attracted, or convinced to buy more from the firm. In this kind of situation one might well ask, why continue to make the 80% of products that only generate 20% of profits? Companies rarely ask these questions, perhaps because to answer them would mean very radical action, to stop doing four-fifths of what you are doing is not a trivial change. What J.B. Say called the work of entrepreneurs, modern financiers call arbitrage. International financial markets are very quick to correct anomalies in valuation, for example between exchange rates. But business organizations and individuals are generally very poor at this sort of entrepreneurship or arbitrage, at shifting resources from where they have weak results to where they have powerful results, or at cutting off low-value resources and buying more high-value resources. Most of the time, 
we do not realize the extent to which some resources, but only a small minority, are super productive what Joseph Huron called the vital few while the majority the trivial many exhibit little productivity or else actually have negative value. If we did realize the difference between the vital few and the trivial many in all aspects of our lives, and if we did something about it, we could multiply anything that we valued. The 80 20 Principle and Chaos Theory Probability theory tells us that it is virtually impossible for all the applications of the 80 20 Principle to occur randomly, as a freak of chance. We can only explain the principle by positing some deeper meaning or cause that lurks behind it. Pareto himself grappled with this issue, trying to apply a consistent methodology to the study of society he searched for theories that picture facts of experience and observation, for regular patterns, social laws, or uniformities that explain the behavior of individuals and in society. Pareto's sociology failed to find a persuasive key. He died long before the emergence of chaos theory, which has great parallels with the 80 20 principle and helps to explain it. The last third of the 20th century has seen a revolution in the way that scientists think about the universe, overturning the prevailing wisdom for the past 350 years. That prevailing wisdom was a machine-based and rational view, which itself was a great advance on the mystical and random view of the world which was held in the Middle Ages. The machine-based view converted God from being an irrational and unpredictable force into a more user-friendly clockmaker-engineer. The view of the world held from the 17th century and still prevalent today, except in advanced scientific circles, was immensely comforting and useful. All phenomena were reduced to regular, predictable, linear relationships. For example, A causes B, B causes C, and A and C cause D. This worldview enabled any individual part of the universe the operation of the human heart, for example, or of any individual market to be analyzed separately, because the whole was the sum of the parts and vice versa. But in the second half of the 20th century it seems much more accurate to view the world as an evolving organism where the whole system is more than the sum of its parts, and where relationships between the parts are non-linear. Causes are difficult to pin down. There are complex interdependencies between causes, and causes, and effects are blurred. The snag with linear thinking is that it doesn't always work, it is an oversimplification of reality. Equilibrium is illusory or fleeting. The universe is wonky. Yet chaos theory, despite its name, does not say that everything is a hopeless and incomprehensible mess. Rather, there is a self-organizing logic lurking behind the disorder, a predictable non-linearity something which economist Paul Krugman has called spooky, eerie and terrifyingly exact. Point nine: The logic is more difficult to describe than to detect, and is not totally dissimilar to the recurrence of a theme in a piece of music. Certain characteristic patterns recur, but with infinite and unpredictable variety. Chaos theory and the 80 20 principle illuminate each other. What have chaos theory and related scientific concepts got to do with the 80 20 principle? Although no one else appears to have made the link, I think the answer is, a great deal. The principle of imbalance. The common thread between chaos theory and the 80 20 principle is the issue of balance or, more precisely, imbalance. Both chaos theory and the 80 20 principle assert, with a great deal of empirical backing, that the universe is unbalanced. They both say that the world is not linear, cause and effect are rarely linked in an equal way. Both also place great store by self-organization, some forces are always more forceful than others and will try to grab more than their fair share of resources. Chaos theory helps to explain why and how this imbalance happens by tracing a number of developments over time. The universe is not a straight line. The 80 20 principle like chaos theory, is based around the idea of non-linearity. A great deal of what happens is unimportant and can be disregarded. Yet there are always a few forces that have an influence way beyond their numbers. These are the forces that must be identified and watched. If they are forces for good, we should multiply them. If they are forces we don't like, we need to think very carefully about how to neutralize them. The 80 20 principle supplies a very powerful empirical test of nonlinearity in any system, we can ask, do 20% of causes lead to 80% of results? 
is 80 percenter of any phenomenon associated with only 20 percenter of a related phenomenon? This is a useful method to flush out nonlinearity, but it is even more useful because it directs us to identifying the unusually powerful forces at work. Feedback loops distort and disturb balance. The 80 20th principle is also consistent with, and can be explained by reference to, the feedback loops identified by chaos theory, whereby small initial influences can become greatly multiplied and produce highly unexpected results, which nevertheless can be explained in retrospect. In the absence of feedback loops, the natural distribution of phenomena would be 50 slash 50 inputs of a given frequency would lead to commensurate results. If is only because of positive and negative feedback loops that causes do not have equal results. Yet it also seems to be true that powerful positive feedback loops only affect a small minority of the inputs. This helps to explain why those small minority of inputs can exert so much influence. We can see positive feedback loops operating in many areas, explaining how it is that we typically end up with 80 20ths rather than 50 50ths relationships between populations. For example, the rich get richer, not just, or mainly, because of superior abilities, but because riches beget riches. A similar phenomenon exists with goldfish in a pond. Even if you start with goldfish almost exactly the same size, those that are slightly bigger become very much bigger, because, even with only slight initial advantages in stronger propulsion and larger mouths, they are able to capture and gobble up disproportionate amounts of food. The tipping point. Related to the idea of feedback loops is the concept of the tipping point. Up to a certain point, a new force whether it is a new product, a disease, a new rock group or a new social habit such as jogging or roller belating finds it difficult to make headway. A great deal of effort generates little by way of results. At this point many pioneers give up. But if the new force persists and can cross a certain invisible line, a small amount of additional effort can reap huge returns. This invisible line is the tipping point. The concept comes from the principles of epidemic theory. The tipping point is the point at which an ordinary and stable phenomenon a low level flu outbreak can turn into a public health crisis 10 because of the number of people who are infected and can therefore infect others. And since the behavior of epidemics is nonlinear and they don't behave in the way we expect, Small changes like bringing new infections down to 30,000 from 40,000 can have huge effects. It all depends when and how the changes are made 11 first come, best served. Chaos theory advocates sensitive dependence on initial conditions 12 what happens first, even something ostensibly trivial, can have a disproportionate effect. This resonates with, and helps to explain, the 80 20th principle. The latter states that a minority of causes exert a majority of effects. One limitation of the 80 20th principle, taken in isolation, is that it always represents a snapshot of what is true now, or, more precisely, in the very recent past when the snapshot was taken. This is where chaos theory's doctrine of sensitive dependence on initial conditions is helpful. A small lead early on can turn into a larger lead or a dominant position later on, until equilibrium is disturbed and another small force then exerts a disproportionate influence. A firm that, in the early stages of a market, provides a product that is 10 percenter better than its rivals may end up with 100 or 200 percenter greater market share, even if the rivals later provide a better product. In the early days of motoring, if 51 percenter of drivers Oregon countries decide to drive on the right rather than the left of the road, this will tend to become the norm for nearly 100% of road users. In the early days of using a circular clock, if 51% of clocks go what we now call clockwise rather than counterclockwise, this convention will become dominant, although clocks could just as logically have moved to the left. In fact, the clock over Florence Cathedral moves counterclockwise and shows 24 hours.13 soon after 1442 when the cathedral was built, the authorities and clockmakers standardized on a 12-hour, clockwise clock, because the majority of clocks had those features. Yet if 51% of clocks had ever been like the clock over Florence Cathedral, we would now be reading a 24-hour clock backwards. 
These observations regarding sensitive dependence on initial conditions do not exactly illustrate the 80 20 principle. The examples given involve change over time, whereas the 80 20 principle involves a static breakdown of causes at any one time. Yet there is an important link between the two. Both phenomena help to show how the universe abhors balance. In the former case, we see a natural flight away from a 50 50 split of competing phenomena. A 51 49 split is inherently unstable and tends to gravitate towards a 95 fifths, 99 slash 1 or even 100 slash 0 split. Equality ends in dominance, that is one of the messages of chaos theory. The 80 20 principle's message is different yet complementary it tells us that, at any one point, a majority of any phenomenon will be explained or caused by a minority of the actors participating in the phenomenon. 80 percenter of the results come from 20 percenter of the causes. A few things are important, most are not. The 80 20 principle sorts good movies from bad. One of the most dramatic examples of the 80 20 principle at work is with movies. Two economists 14 have just made a study of the revenues and lifespans of 300 movies released over an 18-month period. They found that four movies just 1.3% of the total earned 80% of box office revenues, the other 296 movies or 98.7% earned only 20% of the gross. So movies, which are a good example of unrestricted markets at work, produce virtually an 80-1 rule a very clear demonstration of the principle of imbalance. Even more intriguing is why. It transpires that moviegoers behave just like gas particles in random motion. As identified by chaos theory, gas particles, ping-pong balls, or moviegoers all behave at random, but produce a predictably unbalanced result. Word of mouth, from reviews and the first audiences, determines whether the second set of audiences will be large or small which determines the next set and so on. Movies like Independence Day or Mission Impossible continue to play to packed houses, while other star-studded and expensive movies, like Waterworld or Daylight, very quickly play to smaller and smaller houses, and then none at all. This is the 80 20 principle working with a vengeance. A Guide to this Guidebook Chapter 2 explains how you can put the 80 20 principle into practice and explores the distinction between 80 20 analysis and 80 20 thinking, both of which are useful methods derived from the 80 20 principle. 80 20 analysis is a systematic, quantitative method of comparing causes and effects. 80 20 thinking is a broader, less precise, and more intuitive procedure comprising the mental models and habits that enable us to hypothesize what are the important causes of anything important in our lives, to identify these causes, and to make sharp improvements in our position by redeploying our resources accordingly. Part 2, Corporate Success Needn't Be a Mystery summarizes the most powerful business uses of the 80 20 principle. These uses have been tried and tested and found to be of immense value, yet remain curiously unexploited by most of the business community. There is little in my summary that is original, but anyone seeking major profit improvement, whether for a small or large business, should find this a very useful primer and the first ever to appear in a book. Part 3, Work Less, Earn and Enjoy More shows how the 80 20 principle can be used to raise the level at which you are operating in both your work and personal life. This is a pioneering attempt to apply the 80 20 principle on a novel canvas, and the attempt, although I am sure it is imperfect and incomplete in many ways, does lead to some surprising insights. For example, 80 percenter of the typical person's happiness or achievement in life occurs in a small proportion of that life. The peaks of great personal value can usually be greatly expanded. The common view is that we are short of time. My application of the 80 20 principle suggests the reverse, that we are actually awash with time and profligate in its abuse. Part 4, Crescendo Progress Regained draws the themes together and positions the 80 20 principle as the greatest secret engine of progress available to us all. It hints at the uses that could be made of the 80 20 principle for the public good as well as for corporate wealth creation and personal advancement. Why the 80 20 principle brings good news. 
I want to end this introduction on a personal rather than a procedural note. I believe that the 80-20th's principle is enormously hopeful. Certainly, the principle brings home what may be evident anyway, that there is a tragic amount of waste everywhere, in the way that nature operates, in business, in society and in our own lives. If the typical pattern is for 80 percenter of results to come from 20 percenter of inputs, it is necessarily typical too that 80 percenter the great majority of inputs are having only a marginal 20 percent impact. The paradox is that such waste can be wonderful news, if we can use the 80 20th's principle creatively, not just to identify and castigate low productivity but to do something positive about it. There is enormous scope for improvement by rearranging and redirecting both nature and our own lives. Improving on nature, refusing to accept the status quo, is the root of all progress, evolutionary, scientific, social, and personal. George Bernard Shaw put it well, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore all progress depends on the unreasonable man 15 The implication of the 80-20th's principle is that output can be not just increased but multiplied, if we can make the low productivity inputs nearly as productive as the high productivity inputs. Successful experiments with the 80-20th's principle in the business arena suggest that, with creativity and determination, this leap in value can usually be made. There are two routes to achieving this. One is to reallocate the resources from unproductive to productive uses, the secret of all entrepreneurs down the ages. Find a round hole for a round peg, a square hole for a square peg, and a perfect fit for any shape in between. Experience suggests that every resource has its ideal arena, where the resource can be tens or hundreds of times more effective than in most other arenas. The other route to progress the method of scientists, doctors, preachers, computer systems designers, educationalists, and trainers is to find ways to make the unproductive resources more effective, even in their existing applications, to make the weak resources behave as though they were their more productive cousins, to mimic, if necessary by intricate rote learning procedures, the highly productive resources. The few things that work fantastically well should be identified, cultivated, nurtured, and multiplied. At the same time, the waste the majority of things that will always prove to be of low value to man and beast should be abandoned or severely cut back. As I have been writing this book and observed thousands of examples of the 80-20th's principle, I have had my faith reinforced, faith in progress, in great leaps forward, and in mankind's ability, individually and collectively, to improve the hand that nature has dealt. Joseph Ford comments, God plays dice with the universe but they're loaded dice. And the main objective is to find out by what rules they were loaded and how we can use them for our own ends. 16 The 80-20th's principle can help us achieve precisely that. 2 How to think 80-20th's Chapter 1 explained the concept behind the 80-20th's principle. This chapter will discuss how the 80-20th's principle works in practice and what it can do for you. Two applications of the principle, 80-20th's analysis and 80-20th's thinking provide a practical philosophy which will help you understand and improve your life. Definition of the 80-20th's Principle The 80-20th's Principle states that there is an inbuilt imbalance between causes and results, inputs and outputs, and effort and reward. Typically, causes, inputs or effort divide into two categories. The majority, that have little impact. A small minority, that have a major, dominant impact. Typically also, results, outputs or rewards are derived from a small proportion of the causes, inputs, or effort aimed at producing the results, outputs or rewards. The relationship between causes, inputs, or efforts on the one hand, and results, outputs or rewards on the other, is therefore typically unbalanced. When this imbalance can be measured arithmetically, a good benchmark for the imbalance is the 80-20th's relationship 80% of results, outputs, or rewards are derived from only 20% of the causes, inputs or effort. About 80% of the world's energy is consumed by 15% of the world's population, 
for example 0.180 percenter of the world's wealth is possessed by 25 percenter of the world's people 0.2 in healthcare 20% of your population base and slash or 20% of its disease elements will consume 80% of your resources. Point three figures 2 and 3 show this 80 20ths pattern. Let us imagine that a company has 100 products and has found out that the most profitable 20 products account for 80% of all profits. In figure 2, the bar on the left comprises the 100 products, each occupying an equal hundredth of the space. In the bar on the right are the total profits of the company from the 100 products. Imagine that the profits from the one most profitable product are filled in from the top of the right hand bar downwards. Let us say that the most profitable product makes 20% of total profits. Figure 2 therefore shows that one product, or 1% one of the products, occupying 100th of the space on the left, makes 20% of the profits. The shaded areas represent this relationship. If we continue counting the next most profitable product and so on down the bar, until we have the profits from the top 20 products, we can then shade in the right hand bar according to how much of the total profit these top 20 products make. We show this in figure 3, where we see, in our fictitious example, that these 20 products, 20% 20 of the number of products, comprise 80 percent of the total profits in the shaded area conversely in the white area we can see the flip side of this relationship 80 percent of the products only make in total 20 percent of the profits the 80 20th numbers are only a benchmark and the real relationship may be more or less unbalanced than 80 20th the 80 20th principle asserts however that in most cases the relationship is much more likely to be closer to 80 20ths than to 50 50ths. If all of the products in our example made the same profit, then the relationship would be as shown in figure 4. The curious but crucial point is that, when such investigations are conducted, figure 3 turns out to be a much more typical pattern than figure 4. Nearly always, a small proportion of total products produces a large proportion of profits. Of course, the exact relationship may not be 80 twentieths. 80 twentieths is both a convenient metaphor and a useful hypothesis, but it is not the only pattern sometimes. 80 percent of the profits come from 30 percent of the products, sometimes 80 percent of the profits come from 15 percent or even 10 percent of the products. The numbers compared do not have to add up to 100, but the picture usually looks unbalanced, much more like figure 3 than figure 4. It is perhaps unfortunate that the numbers 80 and 20 add up to 100. This makes the result look elegant, as, indeed, would a result of 50 50ths, 70 30ths, 99 slash 1 or many other combinations, and it is certainly memorable but it makes many people think that we are dealing with just one set of data, one 100 percenter. This is not so. If 80 percenter of people are right-handed and 20 percenter are left-hand, this is not an 80 20th observation. To apply the 80 20th principle you have to have two sets of data, both adding up to 100 percenter and one measuring a variable quantity owned, exhibited, or caused by the people or things making up the other 100 percenter. What the 80 20th principle can do for you. Every person I have known who has taken the 80 20th principle seriously has emerged with useful, and in some cases life-changing, insights. You have to work out your own uses for the principle, they will be there if you look creatively. Part 3 chapters 9 to 15 will guide you on your odyssey but i can illustrate with some examples from my own life how the 80 20th principle has helped me when i was a raw student at oxford my tutor told me never to go to lectures books can be read far faster he explained but never read a book from cover to cover except for pleasure when you are working find out what the book is saying much faster than you would by reading it through Read the conclusion, then the introduction, then the conclusion again, then dip lightly into any interesting bits. What he was really saying was that 80 percenter of the value of a book can be found in 20 percenter or fewer of its pages, 
and absorbed in 20% of the time most people would take to read it through. I took to this study method and extended it. At Oxford there is no system of continuous assessment and the class of degree earned depends entirely on finals, the examinations taken at the end of the course. I discovered from the form book, that is by analyzing past examination papers, that at least 80 percenter, sometimes 100 percenter, of an examination could be well answered with knowledge from 20 percenter or fewer of the subjects that the exam was meant to cover. The examiners could therefore be much better impressed by a student who knew an awful lot about relatively little, rather than a fair amount about a great deal. This insight enabled me to study very efficiently. Somehow, without working very hard, I ended up with a congratulatory first-class degree. I used to think this proved that Oxford dons were gullible. I now prefer to think, perhaps improbably, that they were teaching us how the world worked. I went to work for Shell, serving my time at a dreadful oil refinery. This may have been good for my soul, but I rapidly realized that the best paying jobs, for young and inexperienced people such as I lay in management consultancy. So I went to Philadelphia, and picked up an effortless MBA from Warden, scorning the boot camp style so called learning experience from Harvard. I joined a leading U.S. consultancy that on day one paid me four times what Shell had paid me when I left. No doubt 80 percenter of the money to be had by people of my tender age was concentrated in 20 percenter of the jobs. Since there were too many colleagues in the consultancy who were smarter than me, I moved to another U.S. strategy boutique. I identified it because it was growing faster than the firm I had joined, yet had a much smaller proportion of really smart people. Who you work for is more important than what you do. Here I stumbled across many paradoxes of the 80 20th principle. 80 percenter of the growth Indiana the strategy consultancy industry then, as now, growing like gangbusters was being appropriated by firms that then had, in total, fewer than 20 percenter of the industry's professional staff. 80 percent of rapid promotions were also available Indiana just a handful of firms. Believe me, talent had very little to do with it. When I left the first strategy firm and joined the second, I raised the average level of intelligence in both. Yet the puzzling thing was that my new colleagues were more effective than my old ones. Why? They didn't work any harder. But they followed the 80-20 principle in two key ways. First, they realized that for most firms, 80 percenter of profits come from 20 percenter of clients. In the consulting industry that means two things, large clients and long-term clients. Large clients give large assignments, which means you can use a higher proportion of lower cost, younger consultants. Long-term client relationships create trust and raise the cost to the client of switching to another consulting firm. Long-term clients tend not to be price sensitive. In most consulting firms, the real excitement comes from winning new clients. In my new firm, the real heroes were those who worked on the largest existing clients for the longest possible time. They did this by cultivating the top bosses of those client corporations. The second key insight the consulting firm had was that in any client, 80 percenter of the results available would flow from concentrating on the 20 percenter of most important issues. These were not necessarily the most interesting ones from a curious consultant's viewpoint. But, whereas our competitors would look superficially at a whole range of issues and then leave them for the client to act, or not, on the recommendations, we kept plugging away at the most important issues until we had bludgeoned the client into successful action. The client's profits often soared as a result, as did our consulting budgets. Are you working to make others rich or is it the reverse? I soon became convinced that, for both consultants and their clients, effort and reward were at best only loosely linked. It was better to be in the right place than to be smart and work hard. It was best to be cunning and focus on results rather than inputs. Acting on a few key insights produced the goods. Being intelligent and hard working did not. Sadly, for many years, guilt and conformity to peer group pressure kept me from fully acting on this lesson. I worked far too hard. By this time, 
the consulting firm had several hundred professional staff and about 30 people, including myself, who were called partners. But 80% of the profits went to one man, the founder, even though numerically he constituted less than 4% of the partnership and a fraction of 1% of the consulting force. Instead of continuing to enrich the founder, two other junior partners and I spun off to set up our own firm doing exactly the same thing. We in turn grew to have hundreds of consultants. Before long, although the three of us, on any measure, did less than 20% of the firm's valuable work, we enjoyed over 80% of the profits. This, too, caused me guilt. After six years I quit, selling my shares to the other partners. At this time, we had doubled our revenues and profits every year and I was able to secure a good price for my shares. Shortly after, the recession of 1990 hit the consulting industry. Although I will counsel you later to give up guilt, I was lucky with my guilt. Even those who follow the 80 20th principle need a bit of luck, and I have always enjoyed far more than my share. Wealth from investment can dwarf wealth from working. With 20% of the money received, I made a large investment in the shares of one corporation, Philofax. Investment advisors were horrified. At the time I owned about 20 shares in quoted public companies, but this one stock, 5% of the number of shares I owned, accounted for about 80% of my portfolio. Fortunately, the proportion proceeded to grow still further, as over the next three years Philofax shares multiplied several times in value. When I sold some shares, in 1995, it was at nearly 18 times the price I had paid for my first stake. I made two other large investments, one in a startup restaurant called Belgo and the other in MSI, a hotel company that at the time owned no hotels. Together, these three investments at cost comprised about 20% of my net worth. But they have accounted for more than 80% of my subsequent investment gains, and now comprise over 80% of a much larger net worth. As Chapter 14 will show, 80% of the increase Indiana wealth from most long-term portfolios comes from fewer than 20% of the investments. It is crucial to pick this 20% well and then concentrate American Samoa much investment as possible into it. Conventional wisdom is not to put all your eggs in one basket. 80 20th's wisdom is to choose a basket carefully, load all your eggs into it, and then watch it like a hawk. How to use the 80 20th's principle? There are two ways to use the 80 20th's principle, as shown in Figure 5. Traditionally, the 80 20th's principle has required 80 20th's analysis, a quantitative method to establish the precise relationship between causes slash input slash effort and results slash outputs slash rewards. This method uses the possible existence of the 80 20th's relationship as a hypothesis and then gathers the facts so that the true relationship is revealed. This is an empirical procedure which may lead to any result ranging from 50 50ths to 99.9 slash 0.1. If the result does demonstrate a marked imbalance between inputs and outputs, say a 65 35ths relationship or an even more unbalanced one, then normally action is taken as a result, see below. A new and complementary way to use the 80 20ths principle is what I call 80 20ths thinking. This requires deep thought about any issue that is important to you, and asks you to make a judgment on whether the 80 20ths principle is working in that area. You can then act on the insight. 80 20ths thinking does not require you to collect data or actually test the hypothesis. Consequently, 80 20ths thinking may on occasion mislead you it is dangerous to assume, for example, that you already know what the 20 percenter is if you identify a relationship but I will argue that 80 20ths thinking is much less likely to mislead you than is conventional thinking. 80 20ths thinking is much more accessible and faster than 80 20ths analysis, although the latter may be preferred when the issue is extremely important and you find it difficult to be confident about an estimate. We look first at 80 20ths analysis, and then at 80 20ths thinking. 80 20ths analysis 80 20ths analysis examines the relationship between two sets of comparable data. One set of data is always a universe of people or objects, 
usually a large number of 100 or more, that can be turned into a percentage. The other set of data relates to some interesting characteristic of the people or objects, that can be measured and also turned into a percentage. For example, we might decide to look at a group of 100 friends, all of whom are at least occasional beer drinkers, and compare how much beer they drank last week. So far, this method of analysis is common to many statistical techniques. What makes 80 20ths analysis unique is that the measurement ranks the second set of data in descending order of importance, and makes comparisons between percentages in the two sets of data. In our example, then, we will ask all our 100 friends how many glasses of beer they drank last week and array the answers in a table in descending order. Figure 6 shows the top 20 and bottom 20 from the table. 80 20ths analysis can compare percentages from the two sets of data, the friends and the amount of beer drunk. In this case, we can say that 70% of the beer was drunk by just 20% of the friends. This would therefore give us a 70 20ths relationship. Figure 7 introduces an 80 20ths frequency distribution chart, or 80 20ths chart for short, to summarize the data visually. Why is this called 80 20ths analysis? When comparing these relationships, the most frequent observation, made long ago, probably in the 1950s, was that 80 percenter of the quantity being measured came from 20 percenter of the people Oregon objects. 80 20ths has become shorthand for this type of unbalanced relationship, whether or not the precise result is 80 20ths, statistically, an exact 80 20ths relationship is unlikely. It is the convention of 80 20ths that it is the top 20 percenter of causes that is cited, not the bottom. 80 20ths analysis is my name for the way that the 80 20ths principle has generally been used to date, that is in a quantitative and empirical way, to measure possible relationships between inputs and outputs. We could equally well observe from the data on our beer drinking friends that the bottom 20 percenter of people only consumed 30 glasses, or 3 percenter of the total. It would also be perfectly legitimate to call this a 3 20ths relationship, although this is rarely done. The emphasis is nearly always on the heavy users or causes. If a brewery was conducting a promotion, or wanted to find out what beer drinkers thought about their range of beers, it would be most useful to go to the top 20. We might also want to know what percentage of our friends combined to account for 80 percenter of total beer consumption. In this case, Inspection of the part of the table not displayed, the middle part, would show that Mike G, the 28th biggest drinker with 10 glasses, took the cumulative total to 800 glasses. We could express this relationship, therefore, as 80 28ths, 80 percenter of total beer was drunk by just 28 percenter of our friends. It should be clear from this example that 80 20ths analysis may result in any set of findings. Clearly, Individual findings are more interesting and potentially more useful where there is an imbalance. If, for example, we had found that all of our friends had drunk exactly eight glasses each, the brewery would not have been very interested in using our group for a promotion or research. In this case, we would have had a 20 20ths relationship, 20 percenter of beer was drunk by the top 20 percenter of friends, or an 80-80 relationship, 80 percenter of beer was drunk by 80 percenter of friends. Bar charts show 80 20ths relationships best. An 80 20ths analysis is best displayed pictorially, by looking at two bars as is particularly appropriate for our example. Figures 2-4 above were bar charts. The first bar in figure 8 contains our 100 beer drinking friends, each filling 1 percenter of the space starting with the biggest beer drinker at the top and ending with the smallest beer drinkers at the bottom. The second bar contains the total amount of beer drunk by each, and all, of our friends. At any point, we can see for a given percentage of our friends, how much beer they accounted for. Figure 8 shows what we discovered from the table, and could also see from figure 7 that the top 20 percenter of beer drinkers accounted for 70 percenter of the beer drunk. The simple bars in figure 8 take the data from figure 7 and display them from top to bottom instead of from left to right. It doesn't matter which display you prefer. 
If we wanted to illustrate what percentage of our friends drank 80% of the beer, we would draw the bar charts slightly differently, as in figure 9, to show the 80-28's relationship, 28% of our friends drank 80% of the beer. What is 80-20's analysis used for? Generally, to change the relationship it describes, or to make better use of it. One use is to concentrate on the key causes of the relationship, the 20 percenter of inputs that lead to 80 percenter, or whatever the precise number is, of the outputs. If the top 20 percenter of beer drinkers account for 70 percenter of beer consumed, this is the group that a brewery should concentrate on reaching, in order to attract as high a share as possible of the business from the 20 percenter and possibly also to increase their beer consumption still further. For all practical purposes, the brewery may decide to ignore the 80 percenter of beer drinkers who only consume 30 percenter of the beer, this simplifies the task immensely. Similarly, a firm that finds that 80 percenter of its profits come from 20 percenter of its customers should use this information to concentrate on keeping that 20 percenter happy and increasing the business carried out with them. This is much easier, as well as more rewarding, than paying equal attention to the whole customer group. Or, if the firm finds that 80 percenter of its profits come from 20 percenter of its products, it should put most of its efforts behind selling more of those products. The same idea applies to non-business applications of 80 20ths analysis. If you analyzed the enjoyment you derived from all your leisure activities and found that 80 percenter of the enjoyment derived from 20 percenter of the activities, which currently took only 20 percenter of your leisure time, it would make sense to increase the time allocation from 20 to at least 80 percenter. Take transport as another example. 80 percenter of traffic jams occur on 20 percent of roads. If you drive on the same route to work each day, you will know that roughly 80 percenter of delays usually occur at 20 percenter of the intersections. A sensible reaction would be for traffic authorities to pay particular attention to traffic phasing on those 20 percenter of jam creating intersections. While the expense of such phasing might be too much for 100 percent of junctions 100 percenter of the time, it would be money well spent in the key 20 percenter of locations for 20 percenter of the day. The second main use of 80 20ths analysis is to do something about the underperforming 80 percenter of inputs that contribute only 20 percenter of the output. Perhaps the occasional beer drinkers can be persuaded to drink more, for example by providing a blander product. Perhaps you could work out ways to get greater enjoyment out of the underperforming leisure activities. In education, interactive teaching systems now replicate the technique used by college professors where questions are addressed randomly to any student, in order to combat the 80-20th rule, where 80% of classroom participation comes from 20% of the trainees. In US shopping malls it has been found that women, some 50% of the population, account for 70 percenter of the dollar value of all purchases point for one way to increase the 30 percenter of sales to men might be to build stores specifically designed for them although this second application of 80 20th analysis is sometimes very useful and has been put to great effect in industry in improving the productivity of underperforming factories it is generally harder work and less rewarding than the first use don't apply 80 20th analysis in a linear way in discussing the uses of 80 20th analysis, we must also briefly address its potential abuses. Like any simple and effective tool, 80 20th analysis can also be misunderstood, misapplied and, instead of being the means to an unusual insight, serve as the justification for conventional thuggery. 80 20th analysis, applied inappropriately and in a linear way, can also lead the innocent astray you need constantly to be vigilant against false logic. Let me illustrate this with an example from my own new profession, the book trade. It is easy to demonstrate that, in most times and places, about 20 percenter of book tides comprise about 80 percenter of books sold. For those who are steeped in the 80 20th principle, this is not surprising. It might seem a short hop to the conclusion that bookshops should cut the range of books they stock or, indeed, that they should concentrate largely or exclusively on bestsellers. 
Yet what is interesting is that in most cases, instead of sending profits up, restricting range has sent profits down. This does not invalidate the 80 20 principle, for two reasons. The key consideration is not the distribution of books sold, but what customers want. If customers go to the trouble of visiting a bookstore they want to find a reasonable range of books, as opposed to a kiosk or supermarket, where they don't expect range. Bookstores should concentrate on the 20% of customers who account for 80% of their profits and find out what those 20% of customers want. The other reason is that what matters even when considering books, as opposed to customers, is not the distribution of sales the 20% of books that represent 80% of sales but the distribution of profits the 20% of titles that generate 80% of profits. Very often, these are not the so-called bestsellers, books written by well-known authors. In fact, a study in the US revealed that bestsellers represent about 5% of total sales. Point five. The true bestsellers are often those books that never make it into the charts but sell a reliable quantity year in and year out, often at high margins. As the same US research comments, core inventory represents those books that sell season in and season out. They are the 8-0 in the 80-20th rule, often accounting for the lion's share of sales in a particular subject. This illustration is salutary. It does not invalidate 80-20th's analysis at all, since the key questions should always be which customers and products generate 80% of profits. But it does show the danger of not thinking clearly enough about how the analysis is applied. When using the 80-20th's principle, be selective and be contrarian. Don't be seduced into thinking that the variable that everyone else is looking at in this case, the books on the latest bestseller list is what really matters. This is linear thinking. The most valuable insight from 80-20th's analysis will always come from examining nonlinear relationships that others are neglecting. In addition, because 80-20th's analysis is based on a freeze frame of the situation at a particular point rather than incorporating changes over time, you must be aware that if you inadvertently freeze the wrong or an incomplete picture, you will get an inaccurate view. 80-20th's thinking and why it is necessary. 80-20th's analysis is extremely useful. But most people are not natural analysts, and even analysts cannot stop to investigate the data every time they have to make a decision it would bring life to a shuddering halt. Most important decisions have never been made by analysis and never will be, however clever our computers become. Therefore, if we want the 80-20th's principle to be a guide in our daily lives, we need something less analytical and more instantly available than 80-20th's analysis. We need 80-20th's thinking. 80-20th's thinking is my phrase for the application of the 80-20th's principle to daily life, for non-quantitative applications of the principle. As with 80-20th's analysis, we start with a hypothesis about a possible imbalance between inputs and outputs but, instead of collecting data and analyzing them, we estimate them. 80-20th's thinking requires, and with practice enables, us to spot the few really important things that are happening and ignore the mass of unimportant things. It teaches us to see the wood for the trees. 80-20th's thinking is too valuable to be confined to causes where data and analysis are perfect. For every ounce of insight generated quantitatively, there must be many pounds of insight arrived at intuitively and impressionistically. This is why 80-20th's thinking, although helped by data, must not be constrained by it. To engage in 80-20th's thinking, we must constantly ask ourselves, what is the 20 percenter that is leading to 80 percenter? We must never assume that we automatically know what the answer is, but take some time to think creatively about it. What are the vital few inputs or causes, as opposed to the trivial many? Where is the haunting melody being drowned by the background noise? 80-20th's thinking is then used in the same way as the results from 80-20th's analysis, to change behavior and, normally, to concentrate on the most important 20 percenter. You know that 80-20th's thinking is working when it multiplies effectiveness. Action resulting from 80-20th's thinking should lead us to get much more from much less. When we are using the 80-20th's principle we do not assume that its results are good or bad or that the powerful forces we observe are necessarily good. 
We decide whether they are good, from our own perspective, and either determine to give the minority of powerful forces a further shove in the right direction, or work out how to frustrate their operation. The 80-20th's principle turns conventional wisdom upside down. Application of the 80-20th's principle implies that we should do the following. Celebrate exceptional productivity, rather than raise average efforts. Look for the shortcut, rather than run the full course. Exercise control over our lives with the least possible effort. Be selective, not exhaustive. Strive for excellence in few things, rather than good performance in many. Delegate or outsource as much as possible in our daily lives and be encouraged rather than penalized by tax systems to do this. Use gardeners, car mechanics, decorators, and other specialists to the maximum, instead of doing the work ourselves. Choose our careers and employers with extraordinary care, and if possible employ others rather than being employed ourselves. Only do the thing we are best at doing and enjoy most. Look beneath the normal texture of life to uncover ironies and oddities. In every important sphere, work out where 20 percenter of effort can lead to 80 percenter of returns. Calm down, work less, and target a limited number of very valuable goals where the 80 20th principle will work for us, rather than pursuing every available opportunity. Make the most of those lucky. few lucky streaks in our life where we are at our creative peak and the stars line up to guarantee success. There are no boundaries to the 80 20th principle. No sphere of activity is immune from the influence of the 80 20th principle. Like the six wise, blind Indian men who tried to discern the shape of an elephant, most users of the 80 20th principle only know a fraction of its scope and power. Becoming an 80 20th thinker requires active participation and creativity on your part. If you want to benefit from 80 20th thinking, you have to do it. Now is a good time to start. If you want to begin with applications for your organization, go straight on to part 2, which documents most of the important business applications of the 80 20th principle. If you are more immediately interested in using the principle to make major improvements in your life, skip to part 3, a novel attempt to relate the 80 20th principle to the fabric of our daily lives. Part 2, Corporate Success Needn't Be a Mystery. 3. The Underground Cult Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully. 1 Corinthians 13 12 It is difficult to gauge the extent to which the 80 20th principle is already known in business. This is almost certainly the first book on the subject, yet in my research I was easily able to find several hundred articles referring to the use of 80 20ths in all kinds of businesses, all over the world. Many successful firms and individuals swear by the use of the 80 20ths principle, and most holders of MBAs have heard of it. Yet considering that the 80 20ths principle has affected the lives of hundreds of millions of people even though they may be unaware of it, it remains strangely uncelebrated. It is time to put this right. The first 80 20th wave, the Quality Revolution. The Quality Revolution which took place between 1950 and 1990 transformed the quality and value of branded consumer goods and other manufacturers. The quality movement has been a crusade to obtain consistently higher quality at lower cost, by the application of statistical and behavioral techniques. The objective, now almost reached with many products, is to obtain a zero rate of product defects. It is possible to argue that the quality movement has been the most significant driver of higher living standards throughout the world since 1950. The movement has an intriguing history. Its two great messiahs, Joseph Huron, born 1904, and W. Edwards Deming, born 1900, were both Americans, although Huron was born in Romania respectively an electrical engineer and a statistician, they developed their ideas in parallel after the Second World War, but found it impossible to interest any major U.S. corporation in the quest for extraordinary quality. Huron published the first edition of his Quality Control Handbook, The Bible of the Quality Movement, in 1951, but it received a very flat reception. The only serious interest came from Japan and both Huron and Deming moved there in the early 1950s. 
Their pioneering work took an economy known at the time for shoddy imitations and transformed it into a powerhouse of high quality and productivity. It was only when Japanese goods, such as motorcycles and photocopiers, began to invade the U.S. market that most American, and other Western, corporations began to take the quality movement seriously. From 1970, and especially after 1980, Iran, Deming and their disciples undertook an equally successful transformation of Western quality standards, leading to huge improvements in the level and consistency of quality, dramatic reductions in fault rates, and large falls in manufacturing costs. The 80-20th principle was one of the key building blocks of the quality movement. Joseph Huron was the most enthusiastic messiah of the principle, although he called it the Pareto principle or the rule of the vital few. In the first edition of the Quality Control Handbook, Huron commented that losses, that is, manufactured goods that have to be rejected because of poor quality, do not arise from a large number of causes, rather, the losses are always maldistributed in such a way that a small percentage of the quality characteristics always contributes a high percentage of the quality loss. Asterisk the footnote commented that, asterisk the economist Pareto found that wealth was non-uniformly distributed in the same way. Many other instances can be found the distribution of crime amongst criminals, the distribution of accidents among hazardous processes, etc. Pareto's principle of unequal distribution applied to distribution of wealth and to distribution of quality losses. Point one Euron applied the 80 20th principle to statistical quality control. The approach is to identify the problems causing lack of quality and to rank them from the most important the 20 percenter of defects causing 80 percenter of quality problems to the least important. Both Euron and Deming came to use the phrase 80 20th increasingly encouraging diagnosis of the few defects causing most of the problems. Once the vital few sources of off-quality product have been identified, effort is focused on dealing with these issues, rather than trying to tackle all the problems at once. As the quality movement has progressed from an emphasis on quality control through to the view that quality must be built into products in the first place, by all operators, and to total quality management and increasingly sophisticated use of software, the emphasis on 80 20th techniques has grown, so that today almost all quality practitioners are familiar with 80 20th. Some recent references illustrate the ways in which the 80 20th principle is now being used. In a recent article in the National Productivity Review, Ronald J. Ricardo asks, which gaps adversely affect your most strategic consumers? As with many other quality problems, Pareto's law prevails here too, if you remedy the most critical 20% of your quality gaps, you will realize 80% of the benefits. This underscore first 80% typically includes your breakthrough improvements. Another writer, focusing on corporate turnarounds, comments, for every step in your business process, ask yourself. If it adds value or provides essential support. If it does neither, it's waste. Cut it. This is the 80-20th rule, revisited, you can eliminate 80% of the waste by spending only 20% of what it would cost you to get rid of 100% of the waste. Go for the quick gain now. Point 3 The 80-20th's principle was also used by Ford Electronics Manufacturing Corporation in a quality program that won the Shingo Prize. Just-in-time programs have been applied using the 80-20th's rule, 80% 80 of the value is spread over 20% of the volume and top dollar usages are analyzed constantly. Labor and overhead performance were replaced by manufacturing cycle time analysis by product line, reducing product cycle time by 95.4 new software incorporating the 80-20th principle is being used to raise quality, with the ABC data analyzer the data is entered or imported into the spreadsheet area, where you highlight it and click on your choice of six graph types, histograms, control charts, run charts, scatter diagrams, pie charts and Pareto charts. The Pareto chart incorporates the 80 to 20 rule, which might show, for instance, that out of 1000 customer complaints roughly 800 can be eliminated by correcting only 20 percenter of the causes. The 80 20th principle is also being increasingly applied to product design and development. For example, 
a review of the use that the Pentagon has made of total quality management explains that, decisions made early in the development process fix the majority of life cycle costs. The 80-20th rule describes this outcome, since 80% of the life cycle costs are usually locked in after only 20% of the development time. Point six, the impact of the quality revolution on customer satisfaction and value, and on the competitive positions of individual firms and indeed of whole nations, has been little noted but is truly massive. The 80-20th's principle was clearly one of the vital few inputs to the quality revolution. But the underground influence of the 80-20th's principle does not stop there. It also played a key role in a second revolution that combined with the first to create today's global consumer society. The second 80-20th's wave, the information revolution. The information revolution that began in the 1960s has already transformed work habits and the efficiency of large tracts of business. It is just beginning to do more than this to help change the nature of the organizations that are today's dominant force in society the 80-20th's principle was, is, and will be a key accessory of the information revolution, helping to direct its force intelligently. Perhaps because they were close to the quality movement, the computing and software professionals behind the information revolution were generally familiar with the 80-20th's principle and used it extensively. To judge by the number of computing and software articles that refer to the 80-20th's principle, most hardware and software developers understand and use it in their daily work. The information revolution has been most effective when using the 80-20th's principle's concepts of selectivity and simplicity. As two separate project directors testify, think small. Don't plan to the nth degree on the first day. The return on investment usually follows the 80-20th rule, 80% 80 of the benefits will be found in the simplest 20% of the system, and the final 20% of the benefits will come from the most complex 80% of the system. Point seven. Apple used the 80-20th's principle in developing the Apple Newton message pad, an electronic personal organizer, the Newton engineers took advantage of a slightly modified version of 80-20th's. They found that 0.01% of a person's vocabulary was sufficient to do 50% of the things you want to do with a small handheld computer. It increasingly, software is substituting for hardware, using the 80-20th's principle. An example is the RISC software invented in 1994. RISC is based on a variation of the 80-20th's rule. This rule assumes that most software spends 80% of its time executing only 20% of the available instructions. RISC processors optimize the performance of that 20%, and keep chip size and cost down by eliminating the other 80%. RISC does in software what CISC the previously dominant system does in silicon. Point nine. Those who apply software know that, even though it is incredibly efficient, usage follows 80-20th's patterns. As one developer states, the business world has long abided by the 80-20th's rule. It's especially true for software, where 80% of a product's uses take advantage of only 20% of its capabilities. That means that most of us pay for what we don't want or need. Software developers finally seem to understand this, and many are betting that modular applications will solve the problem. Point 10 design of software is crucial so that the most used functions are the easiest to use. The same approach is being used for new database services, how do WordPerfect and other software developers do it? First, they identify what customers want most of the time and how they want to do it the old 80-20th rule, people use 20% of a program's functions 80% of the time. Good software developers make high use functions as simple and automatic and inevitable as possible. Translating such an approach to today's database services would mean looking at key customer use all the time. How many times do customers call search service support desks to ask which file to pick or where a file can be found? Good design could eliminate such calls. Point 11 Wherever one turns, effective innovations in information in data storage, retrieval, and processing focus heavily on the 20 percenter or fewer of Keynes. The information revolution has a long way to run. The information revolution is the most subversive force business has ever known. Already the phenomenon of information power to the people has given knowledge and authority to frontline workers and technicians, 
destroying the power and often the jobs of middle management who were previously protected by proprietary knowledge. The information revolution has also decentralized corporations physically, the phone, the fax, the PC, the modem, and the increasing miniaturization and mobility of these technologies have already begun to destroy the power of corporate palaces and those who sit, or used to sit, in them. Ultimately, the information revolution will help to destroy the profession of management itself, thus enabling much greater direct value creation by doers in corporations for their key customers. Point 12 The value of automated information is increasing exponentially, much faster than we can use it. The key to using this power effectively, now and in the future, lies in selectivity, in applying the 80 20 principle. Peter Drucker points the way, a database, no matter how copious, is not information. It is information's or. The information a business most depends on is available, if at all, only in a primitive and disorganized form. For what a business needs the most for its decisions especially its strategic ones are data about what goes on outside of it. It is only outside the business where there are results, opportunities, and threats. Point 13 Drucker argues that we need new ways of measuring wealth creation. Ian Godden and I call these new tools automated performance measures, they are just beginning to be created by some corporations. But well over 80 percenter, probably around 99 percenter, of the information revolution's resources are still being applied to counting better what we used to count, paving over the cowpats, rather than creating and simplifying measures of genuine corporate wealth creation. The tiny proportion of effort that uses the information revolution to create a different sort of corporation will have an explosive impact. The 80 20 principle is still the best kept business secret. Considering the importance of the 80 20 principle and the extent to which it is known by managers, it remains extremely discreet. Even the 80 20 term itself caught on very slowly and without any visible landmarks. Given the piecemeal use and gradual spread of the 80 20 principle, it remains underexploited, even by those who recognize the idea. It is extremely versatile. It can be profitably applied to any industry and any organization, any function within an organization and any individual job. The 80 20 principle can help the chief executive, line managers, functional specialists, and any knowledge worker, down to the lowest level or the newest trainee. And although its uses are manifold, there is an underlying, unifying logic that explains why the 80 20 principle works and is so valuable. Why the 80 20 principle works in business? The 80 20 principle applied to business has one key theme to generate the most money with the least expenditure of assets and effort. The classical economists of the 19th and early 20th centuries developed a theory of economic equilibrium and of the firm that has dominated thinking ever since. The theory states that under perfect competition firms do not make excess returns, and profitability is either zero or the normal cost of capital, the latter usually being defined by a modest interest charge. The theory is internally consistent and has the sole flaw that it cannot be applied to real economic activity of any kind, and especially not to the operations of any individual firm. The 80 20 theory of the firm. In contrast to the theory of perfect competition, the 80 20 theory of the firm is both verifiable, and has, in fact, been verified many times, and helpful as a guide to action. The 80 20 theory of the firm goes like this. In any market, some suppliers will be much better than others at satisfying customer needs. These suppliers will obtain the highest price realizations and also the highest market shares. In any market, some suppliers will be much better than others at minimizing expenditure relative to revenues. In other words, these suppliers' products will cost less than other suppliers, for equivalent output and revenue, or, alternatively, they will be able to generate equivalent output with lower expenditure. Some suppliers will generate much higher surpluses than others. I use the phrase surpluses rather than profits, because the latter normally implies the profit available for shareholders. The concept of surplus implies the level of funds available for profits or reinvestment, over and above what is needed normally to keep the wheels turning. Higher surpluses will result in one or more of the following, 1. 
greater reinvestment in product and service, to produce greater superiority and appeal to customers, to investment in gaining market share through greater sales and marketing effort, and slash or takeovers of other firms, 3. Higher returns to employees, which will tend to have the effect of retaining and attracting the best people in the market, and slash or, 4. Higher returns to shareholders, which will tend to raise share prices and lower the cost of capital, facilitating investment, and slash or takeovers. Over time, 80 percenter of the market will tend to be supplied by 20 percenter or fewer of the suppliers, who will normally also be more profitable. At this point it is possible that the market structure may reach an equilibrium, although it will be a very different kind of equilibrium from that beloved of the economist's perfect competition model. In the 80 20ths equilibrium, a few suppliers, the largest, will offer customers better value for money and have higher profits than smaller rivals. This is frequently observed in real life, despite being impossible according to the theory of perfect competition. We may term our more realistic theory the 80 20ths law of competition. But the real world does not generally rest long in a tranquil equilibrium. Sooner or later, usually sooner, there are always changes to market structure caused by competitors' innovations. Both existing suppliers and new suppliers will seek to innovate and obtain a high share of a small but defensible part of each market, a market segment. Segmentation of this kind is possible by providing a more specialized product or service ideally suited to particular types of customer. Over time, markets will tend to comprise more market segments. Within each of these segments, the 80 20th law of competition will operate. The leaders in each specialist segment may either be firms operating largely or exclusively in that segment or industry generalists, but their success will be dependent, in each segment, on obtaining the greatest revenue with the lowest expenditure of effort. In each segment, some firms will be much better than others at doing this, and will tend to accumulate segment market share as a result. Any large firm will operate in a large number of segments, that is, in a large number of customer slash product combinations where a different formula is required to maximize revenue relative to effort, and slash or where different competitors are met. In some of these segments, the individual large firm will generate large surpluses, and in other segments much lower surpluses, or even deficits. It will tend to be true, therefore, that 80 percenter of surpluses Oregon profits are generated by 20 percenter of segments, and by 20 percenter of customers and by 20 percenter of products. The most profitable segments will tend to, but will not always, be where the firm enjoys the highest market shares, and where the firm has the most loyal customers, loyalty being defined by being long-standing and least likely to defect to competitors. Within any firm, as with all entities dependent on nature and human endeavor, there is likely to be an inequality between inputs and outputs, an imbalance between effort and reward. Externally, this is reflected in the fact that some markets, products, and customers are much more profitable than others. Internally, the same principle is reflected by the fact that some resources, be they people, factories, machines, or permutations of these, will produce very much more value relative to their cost than will other resources. If we were able to measure it, as we can with some jobs, such as those of salespeople, we would find that some people generate a very large surplus, their attributable share of revenue is very much greater than their full cost whereas many people generate a small surplus or a deficit. Firms that generate the largest surpluses also tend to have the highest average surplus per employee, but in all firms the true surplus generated by each employee tends to be very unequal, 80 percenter of the surplus is usually generated by 20 percenter of employees. At the lowest level of aggregation of resources within the firm, for example an individual employee, 80 percenter of the value created is likely to be generated in a small part, approximately 20 percenter of the time when, through a combination of circumstances including personal characteristics and the exact nature of the task, the employee is operating at several times his or her normal level of effectiveness. The principles of unequal effort and return therefore operate at all levels of business, 
markets, market segments, products, customers, departments, and employees. It is this lack of balance, rather than a notional equilibrium, that characterizes all economic activity. Apparently small differences create large consequences. A product has only to be 10% or better value than that of a competing product to generate a sales difference of 50% or and a profit difference of 100%. Three action implications. One implication of the 80-20th theory of firms is that successful firms operate in markets where it is possible for that firm to generate the highest revenues with the least effort. This will be true both absolutely, that is, relative to monetary profits, and relatively, that is, in relation to competition. A firm cannot be judged successful unless it has a high absolute surplus, in traditional terms, a high return on investment, and also a higher surplus than its competitors, higher margins. A second practical implication for all firms is that it is always possible to raise the economic surplus, usually by a large degree, by focusing only on those market and customer segments where the largest surpluses are currently being generated. This will always imply redeployment of resources into the most surplus generating segments, and will normally also imply a reduction in the total level of resource and expenditure, in plain words, fewer employees, and other costs. Firms rarely reach the highest level of surplus that they could attain, or anywhere near it both because managers are often not aware of the potential for surplus and because they often prefer to run large firms rather than exceptionally profitable ones. A third corollary is that it is possible for every corporation to raise the level of surplus by reducing the inequality of output and reward within the firm. This can be done by identifying the parts of the firm, people, factories, sales offices, overhead units, countries, that generate the highest surpluses and reinforcing these, giving them more power and resources, and, conversely, identifying the resources generating low or negative surpluses, facilitating dramatic improvements and, if these are not forthcoming, stopping the expenditure on these resources. These principles constitute a useful 80 20 theory of the firm, but they must not be interpreted too rigidly or deterministically. The principles work because they are a reflection of relationships in nature, which are an intricate mixture of order and disorder, of regularity and irregularity. Look for irregular insights from the 80-20th principle. It is important to try to grasp the fluidity and force driving 80-20th relationships. Unless you appreciate this, you will interpret the 80-20th principle too rigidly and fail to exploit its full potential. The world is full of small causes that, when combined, can have momentous consequences. Think of a saucepan of milk that, when heated above a certain temperature, suddenly changes form, swelling up and bubbling over. One moment you have a nice, orderly pan of hot milk, the next moment you can either have a wonderful cappuccino or, if you are a second too late, a mess on top of your stove. Things take a little more time in business but one year you can have an excellent and very profitable IBM dominating the computer industry and, before long, a combination of small causes results in a blinded monolith staggering to avoid destruction. Creative systems operate away from equilibrium. Cause and effect, input and output, operate in a nonlinear way. You do not usually get back what you put in, you may sometimes get very much less and sometimes get very much more. Major alterations in a business system can flow from apparently insignificant causes. At any one time, people of equal intelligence, skill, and dedication can produce quite unequal results, as a result of small structural differences. Events cannot be predicted, although predictable patterns tend to recur. Identify lucky streaks control is therefore impossible. But it is possible to influence events and, perhaps even more important, it is possible to detect irregularities and benefit from them. The art of using the 80-20th principle is to identify which way the grain of reality is currently running and to exploit that as much as possible. Imagine you are in a crazy casino, full of unbalanced roulette wheels. All numbers pay odds of 35 to 1, but individual numbers come up more or less frequently at different tables. At 1, number 5 comes up one time in 20, 
at another table it only comes up one time in 50. If you back the right number at the right table, you can make a fortune. If you stubbornly keep backing number 5 at a table where it comes up one time in 50, your money will all disappear, regardless of how high your starting bank. If you can identify where your firm is getting back more than it is putting in, you can up the stakes and make a killing. Similarly, if you can work out where your firm is getting back much less than it is investing, you can cut your losses. In this context, the where can be anything. It can be a product, a market, a customer, or type of customer, a technology, a channel of distribution, a department, or division, a country, a type of transaction or an employee, type of employee or team. The game is to spot the few places where you are making great surpluses and to maximize them, and to identify the places where you are losing and get out. We have been trained to think in terms of cause and effect, of regular relationships, of average levels of return, of perfect competition and of predictable outcomes. This is not the real world. The real world comprises a mass of influences, where cause and effect are blurred, and where complex feedback loops distort inputs, where equilibrium is fleeting and often illusory, where there are patterns of repeated but irregular performance, where firms never compete head-to-head -head and prosper by differentiation, and where a few favored souls are able to corner the market for high returns. Viewed in this light, large firms are incredibly complex and constantly changing coalitions of forces, some of which are going with the grain of nature and making a fortune, while others are going against the grain and stacking up huge losses. All this is obscured by our inability to disentangle reality and by the calming, averaging, and highly distorting effects of accounting systems. The 80 20 principle is rampant but largely unobserved. What we are generally allowed to see in business is the net effect of what happens, which is by no means the whole picture. Beneath the surface there are warring positive and negative inputs that combine to produce the effect we can observe above the surface. The 80 20 principle is most useful when we can identify all the forces beneath the surface, so that we can stop the negative influences and give maximum power to the most productive forces. How companies can use the 80 20 principle to raise profits? Enough of history, philosophy, and theory. We now switch gears to the intensely practical. Any individual business can gain immensely through practical application of the 80 20 principle. It is time to show you how. Chapters 4 to 7 cover the most important ways to raise profits via the 80 20 principle. Chapter 8 closes part 2 with hints on how to embed 80 20 thinking into your business life, so that you can gain an unfair advantage over colleagues and competitors alike. We start in the next chapter with the most important use of the 80 20 principle in any firm, to isolate where you are really making the profits and, just as important, where you are really losing money. Every business person thinks they know this already, and nearly all are wrong. If they had the right picture, their whole business would be transformed. For why your strategy is wrong? Unless you have used the 80 20 principle to redirect your strategy, you can be pretty sure that the strategy is badly flawed. Almost certainly, you don't have an accurate picture of where you make, and lose, the most money. It is almost inevitable that you are doing too many things for too many people. Business strategy should not be a grand and sweeping overview. It should be more like an underview, a peek beneath the covers to look in great detail at what is going on. To arrive at a useful business strategy, you need to look carefully at the different chunks of your business, particularly at their profitability and cash generation. Unless your firm is very small and simple, it is almost certainly true that you make at least 80% of your profits and cash in 20% of your activity, and in 20% of your revenues. The trick is to work out which 20% Where are you making the most money? Identify which parts of the business are making very high returns, which are just about washing their faces and which are disasters. To do this we will conduct an 80 20 analysis of profits by different categories of business. By product or product group slash type. By customer or customer group slash type. By any other split which appears to be relevant for your business for which you have data, 
for example by geographical area or distribution channel. By competitive segment. Start with products. Your business will almost certainly have information by product or product group. For each, look at the sales over the last period, month, quarter, or year, decide which is most reliable, and work out the profitability after allocating all costs. How easy or difficult this will be depends on the state of your management information. What you need may all be readily available, but if not you will have to build it up yourself. You are bound to have sales by product or product line and almost certainly the gross margin, sales less cost of sales, dot you will also know the total costs for the whole business, all the overhead costs, dot what you then have to do is to allocate all the overhead costs to each product group on some reasonable basis. The crudest way is to allocate costs on a percentage of turnover. A moment's thought, however, should convince you that this will not be very accurate. Some products take a great deal of salespeople's time relative to their value, for example, and others take very little. Some are heavily advertised and others not at all. Some require a lot of fussing around in manufacturing whereas others are straightforward. Take each category of overhead cost and allocate it to each product group. Do this for all the costs, then look at the results. Typically some products, representing a minority of turnover, are very profitable, most products are modestly or marginally profitable, and some are really making large losses once you allocate all the costs. Figure 10 shows the numbers for a recent study I conducted of an electronic instrumentation group. Figure 11 gives the same data visually, look at this if you prefer pictures to numbers. We can see from the two figures that product group A accounts for only 3% of sales, but for 10% of profits. Product groups A, B and C account for 20% of sales, but for 53% of profits. This becomes very clear if we compile an 80 20th table or an 80 20th chart, as in figures 12 and 13 respectively. We have not yet found the 20% of sales that account for 80% of profits, but we are on our way. If not 80 20ths, then 67 30ths. 30% of product sales account for almost 67% of profits. Already you may be thinking about what can be done to raise the sales of product groups A, B and C. For example, you might want to reallocate all sales effort from the other 80% of business, telling salespeople to concentrate on doubling the sales of products A, B and C and not to worry about the rest. If they succeeded in doing this, sales would only go up by 20 percenter but profits would rise more than 50 percenter. You might also already be thinking about cutting costs, or raising prices, in product groups D, E and F, or about radical retrenchment or total exit from product groups G and H. What about customer profitability? After products, go on to look at customers. Repeat the analysis but look at total purchases by each customer or customer group. Some customers pay high prices but have a high cost to serve, these are often smaller customers. The very big customers may be easy to deal with and take large volumes of the same product, but screw you down on price. Sometimes these differences balance out, but often they do not. For the group we are calling Electronic Instruments Inc. the results are shown in figures 14 and 15. A word of explanation about the customer groups. Type A customers are small, direct accounts paying very high prices and giving very fat gross margins. They are quite expensive to service but the margins more than compensate for this. Type B customers are distributors who tend to place large orders and have very low costs to serve, yet for one reason or another find it acceptable to pay fairly high prices mainly because the electronic components bought are a tiny fraction of their total product costs. Type C customers are export accounts paying high prices. The snag with them, however, is that they are very expensive to service. Type D customers are large manufacturers who bargain very hard on price and also demand a great deal of technical support and many specials. Figures 16 and 17 show the 80 20 table and 80 20 chart respectively for the customer groups. 
These figures reveal a 59 15 rule and an 88 25 rule. The most profitable customer category accounts for 15 percent of revenues but 59 percent of profits, and the most profitable 25 percent of customers yields 88 percent of profits. This is partly because the most profitable customers tend to take the most profitable products, but also because they pay more in relation to their cost to service. The analysis led to a successful campaign to find more A and B customers, the small direct customers and the distributors. Even taking account of the cost of the campaign, the result was very profitable. Prices for C customers, the export accounts, were selectively raised and ways found to lower the cost of servicing some of them, particularly by greater use of telephone rather than face-to-face -face selling. The D customers, large manufacturers, were dealt with individually, nine of these accounted for 97% of D sales. In some cases technical development services were charged for separately, in others prices were raised and three accounts were tactically lost to the company's most hated competitor after a bidding war. The managers really wanted the competitor to enjoy these losses. 80 20th's analysis applied to a consultancy firm. After products and customers, take any other split of business that appears especially relevant to your business. There was no special analysis in the case of the instrumentation company. But to illustrate the point consider the simple split of sales and profits for a strategy consultancy shown in figures 18 and 19. These figures exhibit a 56 21sts rule, large projects constitute only 21 percent of turnover but give 56 percent of profits. Another analysis, shown in figures 20 and 21, splits the business into old clients, more than three years old, new clients, less than six months old and those in between. These figures tell us that 26% of the business, old clients, made up 84% of the profits, an 84 26 rule. The message here was to strive above all to keep and expand long-serving clients, who were the least price sensitive and who could be served most cheaply. New clients who do not turn into long-serving clients were recognized as being loss makers leading to a much more selective approach to pitching for business, pitches were only made where it was believed the company concerned could turn into a long-term client. Figures 22 and 23 summarize a third analysis for the consultants, which divided projects into work on mergers and acquisitions, M&A, strategic analysis, and operational projects. This split demonstrated an 87 22nds rule, the M&A work was wildly profitable, giving 87% of profits for 22% of revenues. Efforts were redoubled to sell more M&A work. Operational projects for old clients, when analyzed separately, turned out at about break-even, while large losses were made on operational projects for new clients. This led to a decision not to undertake the latter, while old clients were either charged much more for this kind of project or encouraged to farm them out to specialist operational consultancies. Segmentation is the key to understanding and driving up profitability. The best way to examine the profitability of your business is to break it down into competitive segments. While analyses by product, customer, or any other relevant split are usually very valuable, the greatest insights come from a combination of customers and products into dollops of business defined with reference to your most important competitors. Although this is not as difficult as it may sound, very few organizations break up their business in this way, so a short exposition is necessary. What is a competitive segment? A competitive segment is a part of your business where you face a different competitor or different competitive dynamics. Take any part of your business that comes to mind a product, a customer, a product line sold to a customer type, or any other split that may be important to you, for example, consultants may think of M&A work. Now ask yourself two simple questions. Do you face a different main competitor in this part of your business compared to the rest of it? If the answer is yes, then that part of the business is a separate competitive segment, or simply segment for short. If you are up against a specialist competitor, your profitability win depend on the interaction of your product and service against theirs. Which do consumers prefer? 
and what is your total cost to deliver the product or service relative to your competitors. Your profitability will be as much determined by your competitor as by anything else. It is therefore sensible to think of this area of your business separately, to determine a strategy for it that will beat, or collude with, your competitor. It is certainly sensible to look at its profitability separately too, you may have a surprise. But even if the part of your business you are looking at has the same competitor as another part of your business, for example, your main competitor in product A is the same as in product B, then you need to ask another question. Do you and your competitor have the same ratio of sales or market share in the two areas, or are they relatively stronger in one area and you relatively stronger in another? For example, if you have 20%er market share Indiana product A and the largest competitor has 40%er, they are twice as big as you, is it the same ratio in product B, are they twice as big as you there? If you have 15%er market share Indiana product B but your competitor only has 10%er then there is a different relative competitive position in the two products. There will be real reasons for this. Consumers may prefer your brand in product B but your competitors in product A possibly the competitor doesn't care much about what happens in product B. Perhaps you are efficient and price competitive in product B whereas the reverse is true in product A. At this stage you don't need to know the reasons. All you need to do is observe that, although you face the same competitor, the balance of advantage is different in the two areas. They are therefore separate segments and will probably exhibit different profitability thinking about competitors puts you straight on to the key business splits. Instead of starting with a conventional business definition, such as a product or the output from different parts of your organization, Thinking about competitive segments lobs you straight at the most important way to split and think about your business. At the instrumentation company referred to earlier, managers just could not agree among themselves how to analyze the business. Some thought that products were the key dimension. The view of others was that the most important split was whether the customers were in the pipeline business, broadly, oil companies, or in continuous process industries, such as food manufacturers. A third faction held that the U.S. business was very different from the export business. Since they started from different assumptions, all of which were to some degree valid, it was very difficult to make progress either in organizing the business or in communicating with each other. Dividing the business into competitive segments demolished these arguments. The rule is simple, if you don't face different competitors, or different relative competitive positions, it's not a separate segment. We quickly arrived at a rather inelegant, but very clear, set of segments that everyone could understand. For a start, it was clear that the competitors were very different in most, but not all, products. Where the competitors were the same, with similar relative competitive positions, we lumped the products together. In most other cases we kept the products apart. Then we asked whether the competitive positions were different for pipeline customers as distinct from process customers. In all but one product, the answer was no. But in that one product, liquid density machines, the largest competitors were different. We therefore settled for two segments here, liquid density pipeline and liquid density process. Finally, we asked whether the competitors or competitive positions were different in each segment in the U.S. and in international business. In most cases the answer was yes. If the international business was significant enough, we asked the same question for different countries, was it the same competitor in the U.K. as in France or Asia? Where the competitors were different, we subdivided the business into separate segments. We ended up with a patchwork quilt of 15 large segments, very small ones we re-aggregated to avoid unnecessary work, usually defined by product and geographic region, but in one case by product and customer type, this was liquid density, where the segments were liquid density pipeline worldwide and liquid density process worldwide. Each segment had a different competitor or different competitive positions. We then analyzed the split of sales and profits for each of the segments, and this is shown in figures 24 and 25. To highlight the imbalance between the split of revenues and profits, we can again construct either an 80 20 table, figure 26, 
or an 80 20 chart, figure 27. We can see from these figures that the top six segments comprise only 26.3% of total sales, but 82.9% of profits, so here we have an 83 26 rule. What did electronic instruments do to boost profits? Figures 26 and 27 focused attention on three types of business. The most profitable quarter of the business, segments 1-6, was classified initially as top priority A businesses, to be grown most aggressively. More than 80 percent of profits came from these segments, yet they were receiving only an average amount of management time in line with their turnover. A decision was taken to raise the amount of time spent on these businesses to two-thirds of the total. The sales force focused on trying to sell more of these products, both to existing customers and to new ones. It was realized that the group could afford to offer extra services or to cut prices slightly and still enjoy very good returns. The second set of businesses comprised segments 7-12. In total these made up 57% of total sales and 49% of total profits, in other words, on average, slightly below average profitability these segments were classified as B priority, although clearly some segments in this category, such as 7 and 8, were more interesting than others, such as 11 and 12. The priority to be accorded to these segments also depended on the answers to the two questions posed at the start of the chapter that is, on whether each segment was a good market to be in and on how well the company was positioned in each segment. The answers to these questions are described in the final part of this chapter. At this stage, a decision was taken to cut the amount of management time spent on the B segments from around 60 percent or to about half this level. Prices on some of the less profitable segments were also raised. The third category, designated X priority comprised the loss-making segments 13-15. A decision on what to do about these segments was deferred, as for the B category, until after analysis of market attractiveness and the strength of the company's position in each market. Provisionally, however, it was possible to reset priorities as laid out in Figure 28. Before reaching final decisions on any segment, however, the instrumentation group's top management examined the two other questions besides profitability, that are key to strategy. Is the segment an attractive market to be in? How well is the firm positioned in each segment? Figure 29 shows the final strategy conclusions for Electronic Instruments Inc. What actions followed this diagnosis? All of the A profit segments were also attractive markets they were growing, had high barriers to entry for new competitors, had more demand than capacity faced no threat from competing technologies and had high bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis both customers and component suppliers. As a result, nearly all the competitors in these markets made good money. My client was also well positioned in each segment, meaning that it had a high market share and was one of the top three suppliers. Its technology was above average and its cost position better than average, that is, lower cost, compared to its competitors. Since these were also the most profitable segments, the analysis confirmed the implications of the 80 20 profit comparison. Segments 1 to 6 therefore remained, A segments and effort was concentrated on keeping all existing business and gaining market share in these segments by increasing sales to current customers and converting new ones. The strategy could now be refined for some of the other segments in the B category. Segment 9 was interesting. Profitability was moderate, but this was not because the market was unattractive, on the contrary, it was highly attractive, with most of the other players making very good profits. But my client had a low market share and a high cost position in this segment, largely because they were using old technology. To update the technology would have taken a terrific effort and would have been very expensive. A decision was made, therefore, to harvest the segment which meant cutting the effort going to protect the business and raising prices. This was expected to lead to a loss in sales but, for a time, to higher profits. In fact, cutting the effort and raising prices did raise margins, but led to very little loss of sales in the short term. 
It turned out that the customers were mainly locked into the old technology themselves and had little choice of alternative suppliers until they switched over to the new technology. For my client profitability rose from 12.9% to over 20%er although it was recognized that this might be a temporary fill-up. Segments 10 and 11 were ones where the instrumentation group had leading market shares, but they were structurally unattractive markets. Market size was declining, there was overcapacity and the customers held all the cards and could negotiate very keen prices. Despite the fact that it was a market leader, my client decided to deem phaseize these segments and all new investment was cancelled. Although for different reasons, the same decision applied to segment 12. The market was even more unattractive and the firm had only a moderate market share. All new marketing programs, as well as investments, were sidelined. What about the X category, the loss makers? Here it was found that two of the three segments, 14 and 15, were large but deeply unattractive markets in which the firm was in any case only a marginal player. A decision was made to leave both segments, in one case by selling part of a factory to a competitor. The price realized was very low, but at least there was some cash benefit and some jobs were preserved in addition to the losses being stopped. In the other case operations had to be closed altogether. Segment 13, also in the X group, experienced a different fate. Although the group lost money in this business, it was a structurally attractive market, growing at 10 per center per annum and with most competitors making high returns. In fact, although the group was making a loss after allocating all costs, the gross margin in the segment was quite high. Its problem was that it had only entered the market the previous year and was having to make heavy investments in technology and sales effort. But it was gaining market share and, if it kept up its rate of progress, could hope to become one of the largest suppliers within three years. At that stage, with higher sales to spread the costs, it could expect to make high returns. It decided to put even more effort into segment 13 so that the group could become a scale player, that is, operate at the minimum size necessary to be profitable, as soon as possible. Don't take 80 20ths analysis to simplistic conclusions. Segment 13 in the above example helps to illustrate the point that 80 20th analysis of profits does not give us all the right answers. The analysis is bound to be a snapshot at a point in time and cannot, to start with, provide a picture of the trend or of forces that could change profitability. Profitability analysis of the 80 20th type is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of good strategy. On the other hand, it is undoubtedly true that the best way to start making money is to stop losing money. Note that, with the exception of segment 13, the simple 80 20th profit analysis would have given more or less the right result in 14 out of the 15 segments, comprising over 90% of revenues. This does not mean that strategic analysis should stop with 80 20th analysis, but that it should start with it. For the full answer you must look at segment market attractiveness and at how well the firm is positioned in each segment. The actions taken by the instrumentation group are summarized in figure 30. 80 20ths as a guide to the future developing your firm into a different animal. This concludes our strategic review of existing business segments, where it is advisable to start with 80 20ths profit analyses. As we have seen, these analyses are indispensable in arriving at segment strategy. But we have still not by any means exhausted the use of the 80 20ths principle in strategy. The principle is also of enormous value in identifying the next leaps forward for your business. We tend to assume that our organizations, and our industries, are doing pretty much the best they can. We tend to think that our business world is highly competitive and has reached some sort of equilibrium or end game. Nothing could be further from the truth. It would be far better to start from the proposition that your industry is all screwed up and could be structured much more effectively to provide what customers want. And as far as your organization is concerned, your ambition could be to transform it within the next decade, so that in 10 years time your people will look back, shake their heads ruefully and say to each other, I can't believe we used to do things that way. We must have been crazy. Innovation is the name of the game, it is absolutely crucial to future competitive advantage. 
We tend to think that innovation is difficult, but with creative use of the 80-20th's principle innovation can be both easy and fun. Consider, for example, the following ideas. 80% of the profits made by all industries are made by 20% of industries. Make a list of the most profitable industries that you are aware of such as pharmaceuticals or consulting and ask why your industry can't be more like these. 80% of the profits made Indiana any industry are made by 20% of firms. If you aren't one of these, what are they doing right that you are not? 80 20ths as a guide to the future developing your firm into a different animal. This concludes our strategic review of existing business segments, where it is advisable to start with 80 20ths profit analyses. As we have seen, these analyses are indispensable in arriving at segment strategy. But we have still not by any means exhausted the use of the 80 20ths principle in strategy. The principle is also of enormous value in identifying the next leaps forward for your business. We tend to assume that our organizations, and our industries, are doing pretty much the best they can. We tend to think that our business world is highly competitive and has reached some sort of equilibrium or end game. Nothing could be further from the truth. It would be far better to start from the proposition that your industry is all screwed up and could be structured much more effectively to provide what customers want. And as far as your organization is concerned, your ambition could be to transform it within the next decade, so that in 10 years time your people will look back, shake their heads ruefully and say to each other, I can't believe we used to do things that way. We must have been crazy. Innovation is the name of the game it is absolutely crucial to future competitive advantage. We tend to think that innovation is difficult, but with creative use of the 80 20ths principle innovation can be both easy and fun. Consider, for example, the following ideas. 80% of the profits made by all industries are made by 20% of industries. Make a list of the most profitable industries that you are aware of such as pharmaceuticals or consulting and ask why your industry can't be more like these. 80% of the profits made Indiana any industry are made by 20% of firms. If you aren't one of these, what are they doing right that you are not? Choice, fewer frills, less service, and much cheaper prices. 80% of sales are concentrated Indiana 20% of products just stock these. Another place I used to work, a wine merchant, stocked 30 different types of claret. Who needed that amount of choice? The firm was taken over by a discount chain and now a wine warehouse has opened up down the road. Who would have thought 50 years ago that people would have wanted fast food outlets? And today, who realizes that accessible mega restaurants, the sort that offer a limited and predictable menu in glitzy surroundings at reasonable prices but insist that you give back the table after 90 minutes, constitute a death warrant for traditional owner-run restaurants? Why do we insist on using people to do things that machines can do much more cheaply? When will airlines start to use robots to serve you? Most people prefer humans, but machines are more reliable and much cheaper. Machines may give 80% of the benefit at 20% of the cost. In some cases, as with cash machines, automatic teller machines, also known as holes in the wall, they provide a much better service, much faster and at a fraction of the cost. In the next century only old fogies like me will prefer to deal with humans and even I will have my doubts. Are carpets obsolete? I want to leave you to your own imagination. Just one final example, where use of the 80 20ths principle has transformed a company's fortunes and could conceivably change a whole industry. Consider the Interface Corporation of Georgia, now an $800 million carpet supplier. It used to sell carpets, now it leases them, installing carpet tiles rather than whole carpets. Interface realized that 20% of any carpet receives 80% of the wear. Normally a carpet is replaced when most of it is still perfectly good. Under Interface's leasing scheme, carpets are regularly inspected and any worn or damaged carpet tile is replaced. This lowers costs for both Interface and the customer. A trivial 80 20th observation has transformed one company and could lead to widespread future changes in the industry.
Conclusion The 80-20th principle suggests that your strategy is wrong. If you make most of your money out of a small part of your activity, you should turn your company upside down and concentrate your efforts on multiplying this small part. Yet this is only part of the answer. Behind the need for focus lurks an even more powerful truth about business, and it is to this theme that we turn next. 5 Simple is Beautiful My effort is in the direction of simplicity. People in general have so little and it costs so much to buy even the barest necessities, let alone the luxuries to which I think everyone is entitled, because nearly everything we make is much more complex than it needs to be. Our clothing, our food, our household furnishings all could be much simpler than they now are and at the same time be better looking. Henry Ford We saw in the previous chapter that nearly all businesses have within them chunks of business with widely varying profitability. The 80-20th's principle suggests something quite outrageous as a working hypothesis, that one-fifth of a typical company's revenues account for four-fifths of its profits and cash. Conversely, four-fifths of the average company's revenues account for only one-fifth of profits and cash. This is a bizarre hypothesis. If we assume that one such business has sales of £100 million and total profits of £5 million, for the 80-20th's principle to be correct 20 million pounds of sales has to produce 4 million pounds of profits a return on sales of 20 percenter, while 80 million pounds of sales has to produce just 1 million pounds of profits, a return on sales of just 1.25 percent. This means that the top fifth of business is 16 times more profitable than the rest of the business. What is extraordinary is that when it is tested, the hypothesis generally turns out to be correct, or not very far wide of the mark. How can this be true? It is intuitively obvious that some business chunks may be considerably more profitable than others. But 16 times better? It almost beggars belief. And, routinely, executives who commission product T-line profitability exercises often do refuse to believe the results when first presented with them. Even when they have checked the assumptions and verified them, they still end up baffled. The next stage is often for managers to refuse to get rid of the 80 percenter of business that is unprofitable, on the apparently reasonable grounds that the 80 percenter makes a very large contribution to overheads. Removing the 80 percenter they say, would clearly decrease profits, because you simply couldn't remove 80 percenter of your overhead Indiana any sensible time frame. When faced with these objections, corporate analysts or consultants generally give way to the managers. Only the most horribly unprofitable business is removed. And only minor efforts are made to increase the extremely profitable business. Yet all this is a dreadful compromise, based on a misunderstanding. Few people stop to ask why the unprofitable business is so bad. Even fewer stop to think whether you could in practice, as well as in theory, have a business solely composed of the most profitable chunks and get rid of 80% of the overhead. The truth is that the unprofitable business is so unprofitable because it requires the overheads and because having so many different chunks of business makes the organization horrendously complicated. It is equally true that the very profitable business does not require the overheads, or only a very small portion of them. You could have a business solely composed of the profitable business and it could make the same absolute returns, provided that you organized things differently. And why is this so? The reason is the same. It is that simple is beautiful. Business people seem to love complexity. No sooner is a simple business successful than its managers pour vast amounts of energy into making it very much more complicated. But business returns abhor complexity. As the business becomes more complex, its returns fall dramatically. This is not just because more marginal business is being taken. It is also because the act of making a business more complex depresses returns more effectively than any other means known to humanity it follows that the process can be reversed. A complex business can be made more simple and returns can soar. All it takes is an understanding of the costs of complexity, or the value of simplicity, and courage to remove at least four-fifths of lethal managerial overhead. Simple is beautiful complex is ugly. 
Those of us who believe in the 80 20 principle will never succeed in transforming industry until we can demonstrate that simple is beautiful and why. Unless people understand this, they will never be willing to give up 80% of their current business and overheads. So we need to go back to basics and revise the common view of the roots of business success. To do so, we must get involved in a current controversy over whether size in business is a help or a hindrance. By resolving this dispute, we will also be able to show why simple is beautiful. For something very interesting, and unprecedented, is happening to our industrial structure. Since the industrial revolution companies have become both bigger and more diversified. Until the end of the 19th century, nearly all companies were national or subnational, having the vast bulk of their revenues confined to their home country, and nearly all were in just one line of business. The 20th century has seen a series of transformations, changing the nature both of business and of our daily lives. First, thanks largely to Henry Ford's sensationally successful quest to democratize the automobile, there was the burgeoning power of the assembly line, multiplying the revenues of the average firm, creating mass-branded consumer goods for the first time in history, slashing the real cost of those goods and giving more and more power to the largest enterprises. Then there was the emergence of so-called multinational enterprises, that initially took the Americas and Europe, and later the whole world, as their canvas. Next came the conglomerates, a new breed of corporation that refused to confine itself to one line of business and rapidly spread its tentacles across many industrial sectors and a myriad of products. Then the invention and refinement of the hostile takeover, fueled equally by management ambition and the financial lubrication of leverage, gave further impetus to size. Finally, in the last 30 years of the century, the determination of industrial leaders, mainly from Japan, to seize global leadership in their priority markets and as much market share as feasible provided the final reinforcement to the cult of corporate size. For various reasons, therefore, the first 75 years of the 20th century witnessed a progressive and apparently unstoppable expansion in the size of industrial enterprise and, until recently, in the proportion of business activity taken by the largest firms. But in the past two decades, the latter trend has suddenly, and dramatically, gone into reverse. In 1979, the Fortune 500 largest U.S. firms accounted for nearly 60 percent of U.S. gross national product, but by the early 1990s this had slumped to just 40 percent. Does this mean that small is beautiful? No. This is definitely the wrong answer. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the belief long held by business leaders and strategists that scale and market share are valuable. Extra scale gives greater volume over which to spread fixed costs, especially the overhead costs that make up the lion's share of all costs, now that factories have been made so efficient. Market share, too, helps to raise prices. The most popular firm, that with the highest market share, the best reputation and brands and the most loyal customers, should command a price premium over lower share competitors. Yet why is that larger firms are losing market share to smaller firms? And why does it happen that in practice, as opposed to theory, the advantages of scale and market share fail to translate into higher profitability? Why is it that firms often see their sales mushroom yet their returns on sales and capital actually fall, rather than rise as the theory would predict? The cost of complexity. The most important answer is the cost of complexity. The problem is not extra scale, but extra complexity additional scale without additional complexity, will always give lower unit costs. To deliver to one customer more of one product or service, provided that it is exactly the same, will always raise returns. Yet additional scale is rarely just more of the same. Even if the customer is the same, the extra volume usually comes from adapting an existing product, providing a new product and slash or adding more service. This requires expensive overhead costs that are usually hidden, but always real. And if new customers are involved it is far worse. There are high initial costs in recruiting customers and they generally have different needs to existing customers, causing even greater complexity and cost. 
Internal complexity has huge hidden costs. When new business is different to existing business, even if it is only slightly different, costs tend to go up, not just pro rata with the volume increase but well ahead of it. This is because complexity slows down simple systems and requires the intervention of managers to deal with the new requirements. The cost of stopping and starting again, of communication, and miscommunication, between extra people and above all the cost of the gaps between people, when partially completed work is set down to await someone else's intervention and later picked up and passed on into another gap all these costs are horrendous and all the more insidious because they are largely invisible. If the communication needs to straddle different divisions, buildings, and countries, the result is even worse. How this works is shown in Figure 31. Competitor B is larger than Competitor A, yet has higher costs. This is not because the scale curve additional volume equals lower costs doesn't work. Rather, it is because B's extra volume has been bought at the cost of higher complexity. The effect of this is massive, and much greater than the additional cost that is visible relative to A. The scale curve operates, but its benefits are overturned by the extra complexity. Simple is beautiful explains the 80 20th principle. Understanding the cost of complexity allows us to take a major leap forward in the debate about corporate size. It is not that small is beautiful. All other things being equal, big is beautiful. But all other things are not equal. Big is only ugly and expensive because it is complex. Big can be beautiful. But it is simple that is always beautiful. Even management scientists are belatedly realizing the value of simplicity. A recent careful study of 39 middle-sized German companies, led by Gunter Rommel II found that only one characteristic differentiated the winners from the less successful firms, simplicity. The winners sold a narrower range of products to fewer customers and also had fewer suppliers. The study concludes that a simple organization was best at selling complicated products. This mental breakthrough helps to explain why and how the seemingly outrageous claims of the 80-20th principle, applied to corporate profits, can actually be true. A fifth of revenues can produce four fifths of profits. The top 20 percenter of revenues can be 16 times more profitable than the bottom 20 percenter, or, where the bottom 20 percenter makes a loss, infinitely more profitable. Simple is beautiful explains a large part of why the 80-20th principle works. Simple and pure market share is much more valuable than has previously been recognized. The returns from pure scale have been obscured by the cost of complexity associated with impure scale. And different chunks of business have usually had different competitors and different relative strength vis-a-vis -vis those competitors. Where a business is dominant in its narrowly defined niche, it is likely to make several times the returns earned in niches where one faces a dominant competitor, the mirror image. Parts of the business that are mature and simple can be amazingly profitable. Cutting the number of products, customers, and suppliers usually leads to higher profits, partly because you can have the luxury of just focusing on the most profitable activities and customers, but partly also because the costs of complexity in the form of overheads and management can be slashed. In different products, firms often have differences in the extent to which they buy in goods and services from the outside, in the jargon, outsourcing. Outsourcing is a terrific way to cut complexity and costs. The best approach is to decide which is the part of the value-adding chain, R&D slash manufacturing slash distribution slash selling slash marketing slash servicing where your company has the greatest comparative advantage and then ruthlessly outsource everything else. This can take out most of the costs of complexity and enable dramatic reductions in headcount, as well as speeding up the time it takes you to get a product to market. The result, much lower costs and often significantly higher prices too. It can enable you to do away with all central functions and costs. If you are just in one line of business, you don't need a head office, regional head offices or functional offices and the abolition of the head office can have an electric effect on profits. The key problem with head offices is not their cost. It is the way they take away real responsibility and initiative from those who do the work and add the value to customers. For the first time, 
corporations can center themselves around customer needs rather than around the management hierarchy. Before the head office is abolished, different chunks of business attract different degrees of head office cost and interference. The most profitable products and services are usually those that are left to get on with their own life without any help from the center. This is why, when 80-20th's profitability exercises have been carried out, executives are often staggered to learn that the most neglected areas are the most profitable. It is no accident. And one of the unfortunate by-products of 80-20th's analysis is sometimes that the most profitable areas get a lot more attention from managers at the top. As a result, they can begin to drop down the profitability league table. Finally, where a chunk of business is simple, the chances are that it is closer to the customer. There is less management to get in the way. Customers can be listened to and feel that they are important. People are willing to pay a lot more for this. For customers, the quest for self-importance is at least as important as the quest for value. Simplicity raises prices as well as lowering costs. Contribution to overhead, one of the lamest excuses for inaction. Frequently, managers faced with the results of 80-20th's analysis protest that they cannot just focus on the most profitable segments. They point out that the less profitable segments, and even the loss-making segments, make a positive contribution to overheads. This is one of the lamest and most self-serving defense mechanisms ever contrived. If you focus on the most profitable segments, you can grow them surprisingly fast nearly always at 20% or a year and sometimes even faster. Remember that the initial position and customer franchise are strong, so it's a lot easier than growing the business overall. The need for overhead coverage from unprofitable segments can disappear pretty quickly. Yet the truth is that you don't need to wait. If your eye offends you, pluck it out, just remove the offending overhead. If your will is strong, you can always do it. The less profitable segments can sometimes be sold, with or without their overheads, and always be closed. Do not listen to accountants who bleed about exit costs, a lot of these are just numbers on a page with no cash cost. Even where there is a cash cost, there is normally a very quick payback one that will be much quicker, because of the value of simplicity, than the bean counters will ever tell you. A third option, often the most profitable, is to harvest these segments, deliberately losing market share. You let go of the less profitable customers and products, cut off most support and sales effort, raise prices, and allow sales to decline at 520% while you laugh all the way to the bank. Go for the most simple 20 percenter. What is most simple and standardized is hugely more productive and cost-effective than what is complex. The simplest messages are the most appealing and universal, to colleagues, consumers, and suppliers. The simplest structures and process flows are at once the most attractive and the lowest cost. Letting the customer access your business system as with all forms of self-service creates choice, economy, speed, and spend. Always try to identify the simplest 20 per center of any product range, process, marketing message, sales channel, product design, product manufacture, service delivery or customer feedback mechanism. Cultivate the simplest 20 per center refine it until it is as simple as you can make it. Standardize delivery of a simple product or service on as universal and global a basis as possible. Pass up thrills, bells and whistles. Make the simplest 20 percenter as high quality and consistent as imaginable. Whenever something has become complex, simplify it, if you cannot, eliminate it. Reducing complexity at Corning. How can a business in trouble use the 80-20th's principle to reduce complexity and raise profits? An excellent case study is provided by Corning, which produces ceramic substrates for automobile exhaust systems in Greenville, Ohio, and Kaiser Slautern, Germany. In 1992 the US business was doing badly and the next year the German market fell sharply. Instead of panicking, the Corning executives took a long, hard look at the profitability of all their products. As in almost every firm around the world, the Corning executives had used a standard cost approach to decide what to produce. 
but standard cost systems are one of the most important reasons the 80-20th's principle has so much to add. Standard cost systems make it impossible to know true product profitability, largely because they do not differentiate between high and low volume products. When variable costs such as overtime, training, equipment modifications, and downtime were fully allocated at Corning, the results caused astonishment. Take two products made at Kaiser Slautern, a high volume, simple, symmetrically shaped ceramic substrate, disguised here as the R10, and a much lower volume product, the R5, an odd shaped substrate. The standard cost of the R5 was 20% or more than that of the R10. But when the extra engineering and shop floor effort to produce the R5 were fully costed, it turned out to have an incredible cost, around 500,000% or greater than the R10. Yet, on reflection, the data could be believed. The R10 virtually made itself. The R5 required expensive engineers to hover over it nudging it to keep within specification. Therefore, if only R10S were made, far fewer engineers would be needed. And that is what happened. By eliminating low volume, unprofitable products, which contributed little to revenues and negative amounts of profit, engineering capacity was reduced by 25 percenter. The 55th's principle. The Corning analysis kept gravitating towards a very useful cousin of the 80-20th's principle the 55th's principle. The 55th's principle asserts that, typically, 50 percent of a company's customers, products, components, and suppliers will add less than 5 percent to revenues and profits. Getting rid of the low volume, and negative value, 50 percent of items is the key to reducing complexity. The 55th's principle worked at Corning. Out of 450 products produced at Greenville, half produced 96.3% of revenue, the other 50 percenter yielded just 3.7 per cent depending on the period analyzed. The German plant showed that the low volume 50 percenter of products produced only 25 percenter of sales. In both locations, the bottom 50 percenter made losses. More is worse. The road to hell is paved with the pursuit of volume. Volume leads to marginal products, marginal customers, and greatly increased managerial complexity since complexity is both interesting and rewarding to managers, it is often tolerated or encouraged until it can no longer be afforded. At Corning, they had filed up the plants with loss-making, complicating business. The solution was to cut the number of products by more than half. Instead of dealing with 1,000 suppliers, purchases were consolidated through the 200 suppliers who comprised 95% of total supplies, a 95 20th principle. The organization was streamlined and flattened. At the heart of the market meltdown, Corning turned away business. This might seem perverse, but it worked. A simpler, smaller operation rapidly restored profits. Less was more. Managers love complexity. At this point it is worth asking, why do supposedly profit-maximizing organizations become complex, when this plainly destroys value? One important answer, alas, is that managers love complexity. Complexity is stimulating and intellectually challenging, it leavens boring routine, and it creates interesting jobs for managers. Some people believe that complexity obtrudes when no one is looking. No doubt but complexity is also sponsored by managers, just as it sponsors them. Most organizations, even ostensibly commercial and capitalist ones, are conspiracies of management against the interests of customers, investors, and the outside world generally. Unless firms are facing an economic crisis, or have an unusual leader who favors investors and customers rather than his or her own managers, excess management activity is virtually guaranteed. It is in the interests of the managerial class in charge. Cost reduction through simplicity. There is thus a natural tendency for business, like life in general, to become over complex. All organizations, especially large and complex ones, are inherently inefficient and wasteful. They do not focus on what they should be doing. They should be adding value to their customers and potential customers. 
Any activity that does not fulfill this goal is unproductive. Yet most large organizations engage in prodigious amounts of expensive, unproductive activity. Every person and every organization is the product of a coalition and the forces within the coalition are always at war. The war is between the trivial many and the vital few. The trivial many comprise the prevalent inertia and ineffectiveness. The vital few are the breakthrough streaks of effectiveness, brilliance, and good fit. Most activity results in little value and little change. A few powerful interventions have massive impact. The war is difficult to observe, it is the same person, the same unit and the same organization which produces both a mass of weak, or negative, output and a smattering of highly valuable output. All we can discern is the overall result, we miss both the garbage and the gems. It follows that any organization always has great potential for cost reduction and for delivering better value to customers, by simplifying what it does and by eliminating low or negative value activities. Be mindful that Waste thrives on complexity, effectiveness requires simplicity. The mass of activity will always be pointless, poorly conceived, badly directed, wastefully executed and largely beside the point to customers. A small portion of activity will always be terrifically effective and valued by customers, it is probably not what you think it is, it is opaque and buried within a basket of less effective activity. All organizations are a mix of productive and unproductive forces, people, relationships, and assets. Poor performance is always endemic, hiding behind and suckered by a smaller amount of excellent performance. Major improvements are always possible, by doing things differently and by doing less. Always recall the 80 20 principle, if you study the output your firm generates, the chances are that a quarter to a fifth of the activity accounts for three quarters or four fifths of profits. Multiply that quarter or fifth. Multiply the effectiveness of the rest, or cut it out. Reducing costs using the 80 20 principle. All effective techniques to reduce costs use 3 80 20 insights, simplification, through elimination of unprofitable activity, focus, on a few key drivers of improvements, and comparison of performance. The last two deserve elaboration. Be selective. Do not tackle everything with equal effort. Cost reduction is an expensive business. Identify the areas, perhaps only 20 percent of the whole business, that have the greatest cost reduction potential. Concentrate 80 percent of your efforts here. You don't want to get too bogged down in microanalysis. It can help to apply the 80 20 rule. Ask yourself what are the major time sinks that you can cut out, where are the 80 percent of the time delays and costs in your current processes that you could target, and understand how you would attack those 0.5 to be successful, one has to measure what really counts most organizations underscore fit Pareto's rule, 80% of what is important is supported by 20% of the costs. For example, a study in Pacific Bell's Customer Payment Center found that 25% of the center's work was devoted to processing 0.1% of the payments. A third of the payments were processed twice, and occasionally several times 0.6 in reducing cost or raising product and service quality. Remember above all that equal cost does not lead to equal customer satisfaction. A few parts of cost are tremendously productive, but most cost has little or no relationship to what customers value. Identify, treasure and multiply the few productive costs, and get rid of the rest. Using 80 20 analysis to pinpoint improvement areas. 80 20 analysis can establish why particular problems arise and focus attention on the key areas for improvement. To take a simple example, let's imagine that you are running a book publishing firm and that your typesetting costs are 30 percent or above budget. Your product manager tells you that there are 1001 reasons for the overrun, sometimes the authors are late with the manuscript, sometimes the proofreaders or index compilers take longer than planned. In many cases the book is longer than planned, the charts and other figures often need correction and there are many other special causes. One thing you can do is to take a particular time period, say three months, and carefully monitor the causes of the all typesetting cost overruns. You should record the main reason for each overrun, 
and also the financial cost penalty involved. Figure 132 displays the causes in a table, ranking the most frequent cause at the top and so on. Figure 33 converts this information to an 80 20th chart. To construct this, make the causes bars in descending order of importance, put the number of causes per bar on the left-hand vertical axis and put the cumulative percentage of causes on the right-hand vertical axis. This is easily done and the visual summary of the data is quite powerful. We can see from figure 33 that 3 of the 15 problems, exactly 20 percenter, cause nearly 80 percenter of the overruns. The cumulative line flattens out quickly after the first 5 causes, telling you that you are reaching the trivial many causes. The major three causes all relate to authors. The publishing house could solve this problem by writing into authors' contracts a clause making them liable for any extra typesetting costs caused by them being late or making too many corrections. A minor change like this would eliminate over 80% of the problem. Sometimes it is more useful to draw an 80 20th chart on the basis of the financial impact of the problem, or opportunity, rather than the number of causes. The method is exactly the same. Compare performance. The 80 20th principle states that there always are a few high productivity areas and many low productivity ones. All of the most effective cost reduction techniques of the past 30 years have used this insight, often with conscious acknowledgement to the 80 20th principle, to compare performance. The onus is placed on the majority of laggards to improve performance to the level of the best sometimes taking the 90th percentile, sometimes the 75th, usually within this range, or else to retire gracefully from the field. This is not the place to give chapter and verse on cost reduction slash value improvement techniques such as benchmarking, best demonstrated practice or re-engineering. All of these are systematic expansions of the 80-20ths principle and all, if, a big if pursued relentlessly, can raise value to customers by tremendous amounts. Too often, however, these techniques become the latest, evanescent management fad or self-contained programs. They stand a much greater chance of success if placed within the context of the very simple 80 20 principle that should drive all radical action. A minority of business activity is useful. Value delivered to customers is rarely measured and always unequal. Great leaps forward require measurement and comparison of the value delivered to customers and what they will pay for it. Conclusion, Simplicity Power Because business is wasteful, and because complexity and waste feed on each other, a simple business will always be better than a complex business. Because scale is normally valuable, for any given level of complexity, it is better to have a larger business. The large and simple business is the best. The way to create something great is to create something simple. Anyone who is serious about delivering better value to customers can easily do so, by reducing complexity. Any large business is stuffed full of passengers unprofitable products, processes, suppliers, customers and, heaviest of all, managers. The passengers obstruct the evolution of commerce. Progress requires simplicity, and simplicity requires ruthlessness. This helps to explain why simple is as rare as it is beautiful. 6. Hooking the right customers Those who analyze the reasons for their success know the 80 20 rule applies. 80% of their growth, profitability, and satisfaction comes from 20% of the clients. At a minimum, firms should identify the top 20% to get a clear picture of desirable prospects for future growth. Venman Aktala the 80 20 principle is essential for doing the right kind of selling and marketing and for relating this to any organization's overall strategy, including the whole process of producing and delivering goods and services. We will show how to use the 80 20 principle in this way. But first, we have an obligation to clear away a lot of pseudo-intellectual undergrowth about industrialization and marketing.